Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back to another edition with Debate with Bait podcast brought to you by Most Serious Entertainment and all the f good family members at MostSerious.com. What's going down with you? We glad to be back in the house. We had a great sports weekend, so we got a lot to talk about. We may not get to everything tonight, but of course, we're going to get to what counts. What's going down with you? Make sure you subscribe with us at MostSerious.com. Check us out. Check out Most City, the podcast, produced and ran by my, my brother, the man that runs MostSerious.com, Chuck, the CEO, a.k.a. Charles Lewis, a.k.a. the Poetic Prophet, you know, the whole man, the CEO, the Suge Knight of Most Serious. I know I'm getting carried away, but y'all need to understand. Because without Death Row, without Suge Knight, there was no Death Row, right? Without Mo, without Chuck, there's no more serious. So check out Mo City the podcast with that. Check out Guns Down, Gloves Up with Johnny Binder. We call him Dr. Jeremiah, but AKA Johnny Binder. That's my man. And Dr. Candace Matthews and everybody else at the Most Serious family. Welcome back to the Sports Center of Most Serious. That's right, debate with bait. And we back here with episode 25, man. We ready to bring it back in. Of course, we got my two co-hosts, but let's get the first one out of the way because we got to go all the way to the boroughs. We got to go all the way up to the, they want to call it the number one city in the world, but, you know, that's overrated to me. But let's go out to NYC, New York City, to Cole. Cole, what's going down with you, man? Yo, we chilling over here. You see what my Yankees did to the Astros. You know how we do. You know, we, we sent them to the moon. We sent them to the moon. But anyway, uh, we over here. We chilling, man. It's about to be rain in the next the next four days in the forecast. And, you know, a couple of Knicks victories as well. So you know how that go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, shout out to the Knicks, man. Shout out to, to your boy. You know, the one I anointed. I've been telling you about Bronson. And we'll talk about that, the 61-point performance you know, versus Wimby. Um, but, yeah, man, y'all looking good up there. Like I said, I'm not a hater, man. You know what? Y'all did. Y'all came down here and y'all swept us. You know what I'm saying? But it's all good. It's all good because here's the thing. You ain't beat Elijah one in college, but in the end, what did Elijah one do to you and embarrassed him? So, you know what? It's a marathon, Cole, not a sprint, man. Y'all look good, you know? Even though y'all pictures got tattoos. It, one of y'all pictures... I can't think of the dude's name. He got a tattoo from here, and he I think he got a mohawk underneath the hat. And it came all the way down here, all the way to the side. I'm like, yeah, we definitely finna lose to them. You know what I'm saying? So shout out to the Yankees, man. They starting to look a little bit more hood. You know, they coming out of the Bronx. But no, shout out to them, man. I ain't no hater, man. Y'all did what y'all did. We gonna get ours back. You know, it, it, it's never a sprint. It's a marathon. But well, let's get back here to Houston and Mo City, man. I also got my other co-host, man. I'm so excited, man. My boy Laro, aka Larry Evans, man. He been holding it down Laro. for the past five episodes, man. He ain't here. Shout out to my man, Laro. What's up, man? Man, we hanging in there. We doing the same thing, man. Yeah, that that really hurt about them Bronx, man. Yeah, I, I didn't like that one bit, but we got the new skipper. We got the new look. You know, it's just they new look that kind of bothered me a little bit. So I know it we're, did. We're gonna rock with that. Yeah, yeah, man. But shout out to Laro, man. He been bringing his audience, man. Shout out to everybody who been tuning in because of Laro. We appreciate this love and support. Make sure you check us out on MostSeries.com. Make sure you get in the chat. You can also call in at 281-969-8190. Again, you can call in at 281-969-8190. Also, put your comments in the chat. We'll address you if you want to get in on the topics. And let's get to it, man. Let's get into a little bit of underdog fantasy, man. Let's see if we can collect some money on these sport takes, which I know a lot of people be stealing from us. But it's all good, man, you know. Yo, what's up, gentlemen? What's up, gentlemen? We're another week, man. Another another episode of Debate with Bake, season two, 
episode 25, man. We got one game tonight I want to bet on, <clears throat> and that's uh Phoenix, Phoenix versus the Pelicans, right? And so let's look at uh let's look at KD first. Do y'all think KD gonna uh uh let's see here, have more than 25.5 points? I say yeah. His season average is 27, so I say yeah. Okay, and how you feel about the 35.5 with the points, boards, and assists? That I'll leave alone. I, I'd okay. rather go with just the points. That's just me. I don't know if Baker or Laro got a different take. What you think, Laro? I'm taking the points. Taking, taking the, points. the points. Taking the points. All right, so, we, All right, we'll so y'all feel like he's going to go higher. Yo. Yeah. 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 It's playoff That's time. Safe, and it's the safe bet with him because yeah, he don't yeah. do nothing else but score, but it's all good. So what y'all think about Book? Book 25 points. Now, this is going to be close. Well, I would take the points, man. I would take the points because I think Book, I don't know, man. I can count on Book to score. Mm-hmm. I mean, can we count on Book to get assists? Anything else? I, I think yeah. I think he he well. Bill, Bill taking over a lot of the point guard duty, so I'll probably get, I'll probably go with just the points with him as well. Yeah, so, but I, I, I personally, I almost want to lean lower than twenty five point five for Book. Do it. I'll go with your vibe and your energy. <laughs> what y'all think though? Lower. They, where they playing at? They playing in Phoenix or New Orleans? At New Orleans. Oh, it's on you, bro. I, I don't know right. what to do, man. I don't know. I mean, it is safe to go I'm under. I'm taking the points, and I think I might go higher. higher. You think yeah. higher? I feel like I Cole leaning higher as well. I think. No, Cole higher. went lower, right? I, no, I said I'll go with him if that's the vibe and energy he got. Sometimes I go with energy sometimes, man. All right, I'll go higher. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go higher on book, higher on KD with points. Let's look at Zion. We're going to stick with points. Zion, y'all think he's going to go higher than lower than – then 27 points. Is, is Ingram we'll playing? Home. Is Ingram playing? I don't think he's playing. I don't think Ingram is playing. Ingram's if Ingram's not playing, I'll put him for more. Okay. Rose said lower. You said 27? Yeah. It's playoff time. This is like, like the last eight games of the I season. I know, but Cole, think about it, though. Don't just – because you hype and all that. Yeah, I know you hype. Put it like this. Go with is the, he going to put the... up 27? I mean, he's been on a high street lately, but uh, are you really going to put money – down and he gonna do higher than twenty seven points. Yo, he's lost weight. I, I think it's about what, what to be was playoffs. It's 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 season, so he gonna play hard. I think he averaging like what? What is he averaging, Cole? Twenty one. I think it was. He was averaging twenty one last time I saw. And he getting better. I get what Cole is saying. Like he getting better, but I I'm not. I'm, yeah, so I'm Zion, against it. He didn't average twenty six points in the last ten games. I'm just scared to go over 27 with him. Yeah. Go with yeah. the go with the see. I'm scared because he don't rebound well. He'd be having like five rebounds. Yeah. I'm gonna go lower on the points for him. And then uh and let's do, do but you want to do the are you so Cole, you scared of the, no, no, the do combined? this, do this, do this. Leave Zion out. Go with the 3.5 points for Bill in the first quarter, because I think he'll get way more than three points. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is in the a first safe quarter. Difference. Higher, higher for the yeah. And then McCullum, I would go. They probably got him at eighteen, something like that. They got him at twenty three point five. I'll put him at the five point five assists. I'll put him at okay. That. Yeah, that's safe. All right, that's safe. Here we go. I could rock with that. We gonna bet. It was Herb Jones? Herb Jones. We'll put what, what they got him listed as. What are the other options? Two Six point five rebounds and assists. He have anything with steals? Go go with the steals. One point five steals. Yeah, because yeah, he steals. I think he'll get two steals. I think he'll get two steals. Yeah, yeah. Herb Jones, yeah. Herb Jones get to okay. All y'all nodding in agreement. Like, yeah, because yeah. he might be on our defensive team this year. Yeah, he's first? a real high energy guy. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. might be that. All right, y'all. Well, that's the bit right there. I bet five dollars. We trying to win one ten. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to Underdog Fantasy, and I keep saying that. Uh, y'all need to pay us for saying that. But uh, anyway. Back to the show. <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. Chuck, we don't sponsor. We want to keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's get into a sponsor. Let's get a sponsorship right there. Yo, rep the movement with most serious fashion. Copy a fresh snapback or hoodie or a tee. I'll represent the most city podcast, the bake with bake, or gloves up, guns down. Everything is custom made with love from our top-notch manufacturers. We got a dope range of colors and sizes to fit your vibe. Everything from blue, red, green, black, white, 
and more. Rip the mold and keep it fresh, fam. Hit at moseries.com slash merchandise and order today. Let's go. That's right. That's right. Go ahead. Pick up your merch at moseries.com. Uh, yeah, Chuck, man, I'm going to go ahead and put that request in for a bag because, you know, Laro kind of lit me up about my bag, too, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just to be funny off camera, they be they be lighting me up and I'm glad Cole can't see it. But I have a leather bag that I take to my gym and it doesn't zip up. It's not my fault, but I love that bag. And so it, it got bad at first because Chuck was like, you know what? I could make you a bag. You know what I'm saying? With the bait with bake on it. I thought he was just being generous. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? We can. I thought he was just extending that Laro, like we could we could do that. But then when Laro came back last week, like, yeah, it's time for another bag, man. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, Chuck, let me put in a request for a bag, man, because y'all making me look bad. I don't even want to show this on camera, but yeah, we can do bags. Uh the merch is is hot, man. It fits well, it's not too tight, it's not too big. You know, we're gonna get Laro, we're gonna tighten Laro up with some merch, man. But yeah, Chuck, I'm gonna go out here and put my request in for the bag because I guess the bag looking that bad. I mean, it's leather. I thought it was cool. But anyway, shout out to MoSeries.com. Go in there and check out your merch. All right, let's get to it, man. We got a lot of stuff to get to. We have, we also got a game going on right now. I think it's the LSU women's basketball versus Iowa. Uh, with the Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese rivalry, which we will talk about later on. But shout out to that, and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But let's get to the NFL, and in retrospect to the NFL, it's like we don't have a lot going on other than free agency. We're getting ready for the draft. But let's talk about this year's offseason. Now, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of things people are moving, coaches are moving, players are moving, and everybody's gearing up for the draft. So, with that being said, my first topic for tonight is in the NFL. And the question I ask you, gentlemen, and everybody else in the chat, and if you want to call in to give your feedback, again, call in at 281-969-8190. But the first topic on the agenda is which player or which traded player will have the biggest impact with his new team? Again, we're forecasting. We're just kind of putting it out there. Basically, we're gathering data, but we making our opinions based on what we've seen from the these players and what their impact can be on the team. So number one, which traded player will have the biggest impact with this new team? We got A. Joe Mixon with the Houston Texans, B. Keenan Allen with the Chicago Bears, C. Deontay Johnson with the Carolina Panthers, D. Jerry Judy to the Cleveland Browns, E. Morgan Moses, which is going to the Jets, F. Brian Burns to the New York Giants, G. Legereus Sneed to the Tennessee Titans and H. Carlton Davis to the Detroit Lions. Now, I probably should have kept this to about four or five choices, but these are notable free agent um, or traded players, should I say, to these teams. But let's get into it. All right. Out of this list, and you, and you two gentlemen had this on the list, we we'll start with you first, Larry. Who, who do you think would have the biggest impact with their new team? Biggest impact is I mean, the, the, the one that jumps right off the page is definitely Joe Mixon. I mean, coming here, we haven't had an established running back that can really just do the things that he does here in a long time. Um, the sky's the limit for us in that particular regard. Jerry Judy is going to be a real happy, uh, happy camper in Cleveland as well, uh, just because they needed another weapon and to air it out just a little bit better than they had been doing. And the win that uh, I think people are sleeping on is probably Carlton Davis going to Detroit. Mm. Detroit was a player away and uh, just added a pretty good cornerback. So, that, you know, watch out for that too. Mm. So you saying you going mixing Judy, you say mixing as the top mm -hmm. impact or the biggest impact, believe. Probably followed by Carlton Davis. Carlton Davis is going to have a huge impact on that defense. Because they needed a corner. Mm -hmm. Is he a shutdown corner in your opinion? Uh, it is is debatable but he's a he's a decent corner he's decent a pro corner. he's a pro bowl I, I i would send him i, I think he might have been our pro last year so do you think they could put him on a number one receiver yeah definitely okay all right all right so you go mixing first for sure with the houston texans you got judy and then you said davis or davis could be right underneath mixing yeah, right underneath mixing okay in terms of his impact all right all right immediate cool. impact immediate impact know. all right cole what you got I got Jerry Judy. I got Jerry Judy because I feel like 
they needed another explosive receiver. I think that he gives he takes the double coverage off of Cooper. Um, they already had a nice tight end. And then you got to consider they probably have the best running back when he's healthy and Chubb. Mm-hmm. And I think he gets he I think you can't you can't stack the box and you can't double team anyone on the outside. I actually think they just make the te- he makes the team so much more explosive. So to me, I think that's the number one. My number two is probably Deontay Johnson, because I feel like you drafted a quarterback number one last year. He didn't do too well. You didn't have explosive playmakers. And Deontay Johnson is an amazing receiver. I just think that he's played with mediocre quarterbacks over there in uh, Pittsburgh. And I think that he, if what's his name could live up to the billing of the number one pick, I think this is going to be an amazing pickup. And then after that, I would probably say Keenan Allen because mm-hmm. I think that they're missing. They're, they were also missing outside of uh, more. They were also missing more explosive offensive players that can contribute to the team and really make them shine the way that they're capable of with all the offensive talents and the tools that they have. So, Good choices, good choices. Both of y'all made good choices. I'm kind of stuck in between because when I was looking at this list, I'm saying to myself, um, we talk about which trailer player would have the biggest impact with this new team. The first thing that jumped out on me in this list was receivers. And that's because even with Mixon, and to speak to your point about Mixon, I look at Mixon, even though he's a a running back, I think Mixon can be a multi-purpose back. That's just my opinion. And so what I'm thinking about with him is not so much the running game with the Texans, but what can he provide us in the flats one-on-one, kind of like a multi-purpose back, his receiving ability. Um, and many people might say, well, he didn't do that in Cincinnati, but I think I think with the offense that we have here in Houston, um, I think he's a good check down. I think he's a good back um, that can get you some extra yards, not just in the backfield, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm looking at Allen and Johnson in particular and Judy uh, simply because – for me, with Allen, it's 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 so important. If the Bears do take uh, Caleb, them to be able to have a veteran receiver to go with him. I think that's so key for him coming into the NFL is having somebody that he can rely on, somebody who's fresh and new, somebody, and what I mean by that, who's coming into the organization. And Allen is a veteran. I think it does, it serves a good young quarterback well to have a veteran receiver that comes in with a good attitude, who's got a little bit of, you know, experience behind them. And then I think about, of course, Deontay Johnson and Jerry Judy. Now, to Cole's point, Cleveland does really need Judy in terms of being able to give Cooper uh, some leeway. And what I mean by that is, is Cooper – Cole, let me ask you this. Since you picked Judy, is Cooper your number one receiver in Cleveland? I think he's still number one. I think wherever he's been, he's been number one. And I think he even playing with the quarterbacks that he's played with, he's produced over there in Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Um. So, yeah, to speak to that point, Cole is 100% right. I'm going to go with Deontay Johnson. And the reason why I say that is because I feel like Bryce, that's exactly what Bryce was missing in Carolina other than the offensive line. Mm-hmm. I think Carolina – will and has addressed the offensive line. I don't think they're completely done yet, but I think that's what Bryce needs. He needs somebody. He needs a, a good athlete on the outside, and he needs somebody that can take the top off the defense. I think once he does that, you can put me at the second receiver. As long as you got somebody with Bryce's ability, what I believe in. Are yeah. y'all looking for, like, a, you know, minimal growth? Or y'all think they can contend for the division? Good question. It all depends on what else they do as far as free agency and how they make that team better, trades and all that. But if worst case scenario, when I look at Carolina, one of the biggest things, two things that I when I think about that offense that they didn't have was, of course, blocking. But, of course, big playability. And I do think Bryce has it. He's a little undersized as a quarterback, but I do think, if you can get somebody in there for quarterbacks, especially young quarterbacks in this league that has to be able to run and throw, but I'm talking about throwing, I think you need a big play threat. And I think he serves that. And so I, it's, it's, it's wide open is what you ask because it's like New Orleans didn't do much. And right. And it's the, it's the NFC South. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, 
in, in my opinion, I think Carolina is the worst team in the NFL. Yeah. And Thanks. I think that prediction, five wins, max. Even with Deontay Johnson, if he does well, I just don't think they're better than the Atlanta, especially with uh, what's his name coming in, Cousins. I don't think they're better than New Orleans because Carr is there. And I just think overall New Orleans has a decent team, decent. They have when it comes to all of our offensive defense. And then Tampa Bay, they got Baker, Baker Mayfield. You know the guy that Baker. That's the only reason why he brought in the NFC South is to bring that in. Now, but they're gonna win. They're gonna win that division more than likely, Tampa Bay. But you gotta agree though. It is it. it, Other than Carolina, you're right. You gotta agree though. That has been a competitive division Mm -hmm. in terms of because that division came down to the wire. Even though Tampa Bay did win, and I picked Tampa Bay to win, um, but but Atlanta did well. But I just think I think. I think Deontay will have the most impact because that's just what they need. They have no big playability down yeah. in offense in Carolina. I um, still think they need to draft an offensive receiver or tight end. Or they something. do. They do. But I also think that – so when I look at Mixon and the Texans, I think the Texans got – we all agree that they got their franchise quarterback and Too he doesn't many. need much. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't need much. I think Mixon will have an impact. But when we talk about the biggest impact, I think it's already kind of set in stone what the offense can do. Mixon will make it better depending on his health and his skill set, which I believe in. Keenan Allen, of course. Um, But we talk about impact. We still got a quarterback coming in that we don't have any, we don't have any experience in the NFL yet. So to say he's going to have the biggest impact, I think he's going to have a big impact, but we still have to see what Caleb can do. Mm-hmm. Of course, and then then again that leaves. I'm not even taking. I'm not even talking about these other guys. You do make a good point about Davis, even though I do think he can have some good impact. That's that's still a stout defense. He may be the one to get them over. I think they were one or two players away from getting to the Super Bowl. So I think he'll have minimum impact. That is already a stud defense. But it leaves to me Johnson and Judy, and Judy. Can he have the biggest impact already what they got? He could have a, a substantial amount of impact because I think the Browns are – I think the Browns are just stacked. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like any other impact, huge impact could mean a Super Bowl for the Browns for me. So I'm still saying Carolina because I think Johnson can – to Cole's point, I think they can go from – what did they win, two games last year? Yeah. Game? I think they can go to five or six games. I, I actually think – in a division, if they can make a couple of more moves, they could be competitive in the South. Um, I, just, I just see them, Washington, and the Giants being the worst three teams in the NFL. Possibly. That's not bad. That's not a bad um, analysis. Yeah. But I do think they can improve if they can get some big playability on that offense. But I'm biased. I like Bryce. But we'll see. We'll see. Good stuff. All right. Next, next topic. Let's stay in the National Football League. Let's do a little bit of – well, we're going to see what you guys prefer in receivers. But which wide receiver in their prime are you taking? Choice A, Odell Beckham. Choice B, Julio Jones. Choice C, DeAndre Hopkins. And choice D, Antonio Brown. Let's start with you this time, Cole. In their prime, who do you take on your team and tell us why? It's, it's hard with this one. I mean, Antonio Brown, based off of what we know – and based off of in the but I would have to say Julio Jones, man. I think when you have that size, that speed, that strength, and week in, week out, and who was this quarterback? Matt Schaub and and, and your man that we about to talk about next. I think yeah, Matt he, Ryan was there too, wasn't he? Matt Ryan, Matt Ryan was there. I, I honestly, in their prime, I might have to go with Julio Jones, but it's hard because they, they all good. Odell was Odell. He was Odell, like. But I, what does that I mean? I go with Antonio Brown. To be honest with you, I will go with Antonio Brown. Yeah, what do you mean by Odell was Odell? Like, never Odell mind. Odell was the Odell was the top of the, with his couple of years with the Giants when they was going to the playoffs and stuff. I arguably he was putting up numbers that and doing things people have never seen at the wide receiver position with the catches <laughs> and everything. Oh, outside of Chris Carter, man, outside of Chris like, Carter. Listen, man, you Chris hear Carter. what you saying? Hold on, if anybody in the chat, you cannot possibly agree with that. That is some New York East Coast bias there. Can we, we, we taping this, right? 
We live, right? Outside of Chris Carter, you said he just was doing some Chris other stuff with the catch. Like who? Who are you comparing him to? I gotta hear this. Hold on, Larry. I'm, I'm gonna let you get to yours, but please elaborate. Hold on, though. Let me go with my choice first. I'm gonna say Antonio Brown. I'm not. I'm not. I'm gonna stick you with just Antonio. Said Julio Jones. It's not enough. I said. I said it's hard, but I switched it up. I'm sticking with Antonio Brown. I'm sticking with Antonio Brown. Okay. However, tell us why. Tell us why Antonio Brown. I just think that he did everything. He ran he out the slot on the outside and ran every single uh what you call it route with precision, caught everything. He just couldn't unguard. He was like Santonio Holmes on crack. I, I just really, really like Antonio Brown, man. And his numbers suggest he's a Hall of Famer already. So uh, I think Odell gave you a short window of greatness. I'm but his greatness was greatness, greatness. Like so, he gave but, me but like you, that. Hold on, but you made the comment that Odell did some things that was it other wide receivers didn't do? What was the exact wise outside of been seen before? I'm talking about things that like plays that people haven't seen, just remarkable things like stuff that you saw Chris Carter do. I'm not letting you off the hook with this. Please sure. continue to explain before we move to Larry. Please I explain think, to I me. I just think that when when Beckham was in the heart of his like like the 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 in his prime, when everyone knew him for what he was doing at the Giants, the numbers he would put in week in week out, and the catches he would make, and the double teams, and the hits he would take. And still do the things he was doing. It was remarkable. I'm just gonna let him down his sword right now. It was remarkable. We, we, yeah, so you, you, ask you, you 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 use the name Chris Carter. I'm gonna get off you in a minute, but I, I just you got to down his sword. So are you comparing him to Chris Carter? Are you saying some of the I'm things? I'm saying his doing? hands were are in comparison to Chris Carter. Those two might have the best two hands ever in the history of the game. So we just going to disregard Jerry Rice, Randy Moss. I'm not disregarding them being better receivers. I'm saying hands. Ooh, hands. a lot of East Coast NFC bias, NFC East bias. So you're bias saying that the, 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 the catches that they made were the, some of the most spectacular catches you have witnessed. Is it, not is just spectacular, but they caught everything that was thrown to them, period. Like, I, I don't know if I ever seen Odell when he was with the Giants really – Drop a ball, even when people were hit, because they were playing dirty against him. They was hitting them late. They was holding them. They was grabbing them. He was making. The, he actually made the one hand catch during this generation, probably a little bit more popular. He just go die on it. He that's why I right love him because he just. <laughs> that's why I love him because he just gonna die on it. He gonna die that's on the sword. He, he gonna ride with it all the way down. You sure you're not being biased to New York? You yeah, sure? we might need to play some video. Could we get some video, Chuck? Could we get some video of Odell in the back? Because they hate him right now. I feel like he's dying on this sword right now. He okay, gonna really, bad, yeah, man. he gonna Boston die on the man. sword. Like, like, let me ask you this. I don't know if you remember this because I'm asking you, this, and I'm asking you this not to make fun of you. I'm really asking you this because uh -huh. I really don't remember who was who were the top receivers in the league right around that time. Like, what his career? It was him and who else? I would say during that time, I think it was you would probably have to say it was still Antonio Holmes. As the, I mean, uh, Antonio Brown in the league. It was still uh, was Julio there? Jones. Julio so Jones. Hopkins, everybody on this list and Hopkins. Julio Jones, Hopkins, and I will say, what's the Steve Smith was probably around too. Okay, now Chuck playing some highlights. Chuck, can we just get a minute of what? Because he's yeah, gonna die on this Odell? He just gonna Odell die on this score. And, yeah, and, yeah, and so. shout out to YouTube. I found some OD, OBJ. Let's let's the, just get a with minute. The Giants, they got it's like a bunch of a bunch of highlights. But, though, let's, but we'll let's give just it a get a minute bit. to just kind of see because I I really think he's gonna die on this score. Here they come. Manning under pressure gets Johnson the throws and it's caught. It's gonna be a first down. Beckham will make a first and goal and a flag at the end of the play. He's looking for a face mask out of bounds at the seventh yard line. Nate Allen with the coverage. All right. It's totally yeah, agility is crazy. Manning and the Giants in a big hole. Got to get something going. There's Odell Beckham Jr. down the sideline. Beckham Nothing into something. At great speed. Beckham at the 30 finally goes down at the 25 as he was being chased by the safety Mike Adams. Woo! Mike Adams. Much look, at, look at the space that he's creating. I this like try Odell Beckham against Toller. It's a different matchup. Watch him come out of his break, find the ball. Excellent throw by Eli. Off he goes. On second and ten. 
Is this Sherman guarding him? Manning's going to air it out. He's got a man and the catch made by Buckets. Sherman, is that a Hall of Famer? And Odell Beckham Jr. got behind Richard Sherman. And the rookie good for 44 Damn. yards. How about that throwing catch? Here's Beckham. Right side. What a catch. This kid is becoming a star in a blink. Only his fifth game. This time it's blocked up. This time Manning going deep for Beckham Jr. Did he catch it? He did! Oh my goodness. What's the leaping ability? All right. I mean, all right, I give you the spectacular catches, but I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I show you the same highlight reel with his best ones either. Exactly, exactly. Like, Those were even his best ones, though. All right, but you're going with Antonio Brown as the receiver you taking in, mm -hmm. in their prime. So you're not going with Beckham. I'm not going with Beckham. I'm going with Antonio. All right. All right, Larry, what you got? Man? I also, I'm, I'm also going with Antonio, unfortunately. I, you know, I, I got, I would get on cold a little bit more, but. Nah, it's like, yo, Julio is is about what Cole said. You know, I mean, just taking his, you know, you know, his set of abilities and just putting them into a, a football body. Right? Mm -hmm. He's like the set, closest thing to Megatron mm -hmm. or somebody else that's not even point. around no more. Right. But I, the reason I had to go with Antonio is, in spite of the antics, you know, what I'm saying, in spite of everything, all these other guys got like epic collapses on their books. You know, I mean, Julio's only Super Bowl appearance, you know, the, the Patriots walked them boys, you yeah. know, so that's like that. That hurts him, you know, in, in terms of what I've seen him do. Um, Odell, same, you know, it's like he had the catch, you know. I mean, I, 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 I don't want to acknowledge. His glory days, as much as the northerner, you know, as much as the Yankee, you know what I'm saying. I, I just can't do that. It didn't have that particular kind of effect on me. Like I said, I was, I was following Jarvis Landry and a couple of other, you know, Landry. interesting talents, you know, uh, <laughs> at the time. It wasn't about. Anyway, no, no, no. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop. But now we're gonna get on to DeAndre because DeAndre had the most unsung prime that boys you know care to, to to see deandre has probably the best hands i've ever witnessed you know personally i mean that's definitely a debate between odell and deandre because think about it yeah. i mean he, as far as hands, as far as yeah. the, the receivers that have were throwing him the ball at right. that particular point he didn't even get a quarterback and start linking up with a good right. quarterback till you know i i guess you could say statistically Shaw mm -hmm. when Shaw came around but, but the league took notice. Anything you threw in his direction, he caught. He there were no drops. He, he might have had a two, three year, no, <laughs> I don't know, no runway. There yeah. were no drops. But yeah, no. Shout out to DeAndre too. You know what I'm saying? He's still doing his thing. But yeah, you got to rock with Antonio. He won in Pittsburgh. He's just an un. He's an un. It's a shame because he, he 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 we never saw the greatest Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown never really had a prime, so to speak. That's also very debatable. That's debatable, so, yeah. That's debatable. Know. But um, I get that, and I I didn't even think about that. I think on this list, right? And I could be wrong. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But Brown is the only one who's got a ring on this list, right? Did he get two? Well, Odell got one too. Odell got one in Odell got one with the Rams when he got injured. Rams. Okay. Okay. All right. So him and Brown, but Brown got two, right? Does Brown have one with Pittsburgh and then one with Tampa Bay, right? Yeah. I think so. At least two. He might have yeah. he might have won more than one. Right. I right. mean more than two, to be honest. Right, right, know. right. So that's interesting. Um all right, I want to ask that because when I look at this list, which is the it is good that Larry brought that up because I actually do agree with Cole when I think of Beckham. I think of hands, spectacular catches, and I think about his first three or four years in the league as a young receiver. And like you said, his prime, that was probably his prime because much mm -hmm. of his career, barring injuries and things like that, he didn't live up to what, what he started off as. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say Beckham would probably have the best out of all of these. I could be wrong, and it's debatable. The best first couple of years in the league. He had the most hype. And he lived up to mm -hmm. when he got in. Um, but for me, I got to go with Antonio Brown simply because Beckham and Hopkins 
I think about hands. Jones, I think about size. And the time that Jones played, that was the big thing, the big receiver. Megatron coming on the back end of Terrell Owens. Um, What's the kid that played in Arizona that never got a ring, but I love him? Fitz. Yeah. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. The, the big receivers were coming in, and so Julio kind of headlined those big, big athletic receivers. My man has got the podcast that does a lot for mental health. Brandon. What's the kid's last name? Brandon. Uh, the kid that does uh, – Piv- Not oh. Pivot. Uh, the other podcast. Brandon. The dude, he got dreads. Oh, I know you're talking about Yeah. That. Was it Brand- – it's not Brandon Moore. He played with Denver. I cannot think of this kid's name. He was a big, big receiver. Yeah, it, it's I am athlete. It's I am athlete. I can't think of what's the last name. Is it Brandon Marshall? Uh, Brandon Marshall. Marshall. Brandon Marshall. Marshall. Big, yeah. Yeah, big receiver. Big receiver. Remember, big receiver. Somebody. Him. Uh, some could say Plexico was in that class of those big receivers. So when I think about big receivers, Dre. Yeah, Dre too. Andre, I think about Anquan Julio. Bolin. Right. The big physical receivers, because you have the big physical. We in the era of the big physical tight ends right now, receiving tight ends with Gronk, of course your man Kittle, and of course people would argue uh, the kid in Kansas City, Travis Kelsey, and Antonio Gates. But I think about Julio being in that. Is he the most complete receiver? Not gonna say complete, but as far as matchup problems, him and Megatron, I think about them. But I'm with I'm with I'm with Laro on this one. I'm going to say Antonio. I think Cole was Antonio, too, simply because for me, I thought at that time, as Beckham was starting to go down, Jones kind of held steady, but Atlanta, Jones was having injuries, too. For me at that time, it was DeAndre Hopkins and Antonio Brown, who was arguably the two best receivers in the league. And I went with Brown simply because Hopkins, um, even though he had the biggest hands and he made the, the best catches, the speed factor went to Antonio Brown. Like Antonio Brown was just clearly one of the fastest receivers, one of the fastest players in the league, too. You know who I, if you would have put in that category that I might have taken over all of them because Ooh. I think he's just super underrated. It's Steve Smith, man. See, you always trying to go outside what's in the, the, the choices. Like Steve Smith in this time was going down. Now, nah, I don't I don't think he ever was going down, to be honest with you. Okay, so can you, can you say this for me? Can you say, in his prime, was he better than Antonio Brown? Hands down. No, I answer for you. I, I can't. I can't. I can't. I, I don't think you can say that that solidly like that. I don't think you're even taking into the fact that my man was physical. He played okay. physical the way that he, even outside of the receiving catching. Just the blocking and, the, and 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 being gritty and being the heart of the team. But I mean, that's, that's, that's not, their numbers actually. I want to look up their numbers. But, he, but, but again, he was good, Hall of Famer, sure. But and who did he play with? He played with Flacco. He played with your man. Played with Roslinberger and whatever. But Steve Smith played with Flacco, and he had another uh, a quarterback that was Dilfer. Was it Trent Dilfer? It wasn't Carol Car- Terry Collins or somebody. Yeah, but but I mean, you make it seem like 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 we okay. Let's just take the physical. Let's just take what we see with our eyes. Like yeah, Steve Smith was was great. You know, in terms of because he was so small, he was so tough, and he made unbelievable plays. I'm not taking that away from him. But when you think about Antonio Brown, what was it? Name me one thing. And for me, for Steve Smith, it's not his fault. It's his problem. It's his lack of size. For Antonio Brown, but what did he lack? Size. He was probably more physical than Antonio Brown. I disagree. What do you think Antonio Brown couldn't do? I don't think he could block the way he could. I don't think that he. I. I but I will say, like, it's it's a it's a hard argument. I I don't think that you can flat out say Antonio Brown is better than him like that. All right. Well, let, well that's for another debate. But I'm gonna pull up the stats. I'm gonna pull up the stats. On, on this list that we got here, right? You would agree that Antonio Brown was the best in his prime, right? Yes. On that list, I 100 okay. agree. All right. All right. Because. So look. I put up some stats for you, Cole. Here you go. So here we go. Antonio Brown versus Steve Smith stats, right? We got Super Bowl wins, Antonio Brown one, Steve Smith none. Zero. Super Bowl appearances, Antonio Brown two, Steve Smith one. Zero. Well, he had one. He had one in 04. Oh, well. Appearance. Was he really? Neither a, one of them had big... no MVPs. Neither one had Super Bowl MVPs. Pro Bowl appearances. AB got six. Steve got five. Thank you. 
first time all pro. A B got three, Steve got two, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Second team all pro, one and one. Receiving yards leader, one and one. Receptions leader. A B got two. Thank you. Steve got one. Yeah. Stop trying to go outside the choice. Keep going. Keep going. Steve Smith played way more games than A B. What's total, what's total yards ever? Receiving yards. Yeah, Steve Smith's over him by 2,000. Yeah, because he did more. He and, played punt returns everything. What about receptions? Receptions? Uh, yeah, Steve Smith got more receptions as well. By what, what 30 TDs? yards? What about 30, TDs? 100 yards? A.B. got more touchdowns. Now, don't do TD. Stop. So, so, so Steve Smith has 1,000, 1,031 receptions. 14,000 receiving yards, 81 touchdowns, and average 14 yards uh, uh, of what you call it, catch. He an average 14 yards a catch. He averaged 14 yards a catch. This guy, man. I'm not making it up. Look at him fumbles, too. Oh, wow, 33 fumbles. <laughs> Fighting for that extra yardage, man. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it's cracked yeah, up to be, was, baby. It's 15 exactly. fumbles. It's 15 fumbles. Yeah, for he Brown, for yeah. AP, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't say that because you right. you're not looking at the list. Interesting comparison. Put some but it's on it, Steve Smith. I man. mean, it's subjective though. It's subjective. <laughs> I mean, I mean he ain't have no quarterback like that either. I mean, in that case, I could throw Hopkins in there. He's the, he got the worst one on the list. But we all agree it's Antonio Brown on this list, right? No, no we definitely it's Anto- I can I won't be mad if someone says he's better. I just think that Steve Smith is the most underrated. Receiver that I seen play, man. Yeah, that's your man. That's what I'm saying. You you being a fan right now. We talking about stats. We talking about who would you take in your prime, and you being a fan of Steve Smith because he was five foot five and <laughs> he he what he cut. I mean, can we compare Steve Smith to the dude that played for the Eagles that was supposedly was from L.A. and was in the Freddie game? Freddie Mitchell? Nah, nah, oh. nah. What's the cat that, that just retired? Oh, Deshaun uh, Yeah, Jackson. yeah, yeah. I, I like to compare Steve Smith to nah, him. Don't, don't, don't disrespect him like that. What yo. you mean? I'm not disrespecting. They both are the famous, right? Deshaun, Deshaun, ain't, Deshaun ain't doing what Steve Smith is doing, y'all. All right. That's Deshaun something. got a ring. Exactly. Two. Exactly. Does he? Yeah, I think, I think so. I yeah, think, I think was he on the Eagles team? He might have won. Well, uh, yeah, he was a, a super threat. Yeah, on on for Foles, I, th- I think. Foles and and, and it's hard. To, it's hard to gauge Super Bowls like that and say someone is because there's been a lot of Hall of Famers that are better than dudes that ain't win Super Bowl. Look at Ezekiel Elliott, yo. He ain't win no Super Bowl, but he was. He's probably one of the top re- running backs to play the game. I mean, that's a good point, but I just don't think going it applies back to, that, to play the game. Exactly. Wait, wait, wait. Ezekiel Elliott won the top. Wait a minute. It's, it's just getting worse. Ain't it? It's just getting worse. Ain't it? It's getting worse. Yeah, can't get yeah, this slot worse. Yeah. Why y'all say that he's not one of the top running backs? The DMX falling. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. Probably what you said is while he was playing, he's one of the top running backs in the game, right? While he yeah, was playing, but 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 think about it. Let's put all that stuff aside. His skill level, his talent level. There's not too many running backs that was doing what Ezekiel Elliott was doing. Hands down, regardless of what generation was doing, what Ezekiel Elliott was doing at one point. (laughs) 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 Maurice Claret, maybe in college, maybe in college, he was a bust in the NFL. He was a bust in the NFL. He was like, What's his name? What's that dude? Uh, That other dude that came from LSU, um, receiver. Ah, uh, damn, Phillips. No, Nebraska, Phillips. Oh, Lawrence, Lawrence Phillips. Phillips. Lawrence Phillips. Yeah. Lawrence yeah, Phillips. He was a bum in the NFL, too. <laughs> but we all agree. I mean, that's debatable. Maybe someday we'll do that. Steve Smith versus Antonio Brown or Steve Smith uh, versus Deshaun Jackson. That might be a good debate. You might have something there. All right? I will say this, though. This is the first time y'all all done agreed. All yeah. y'all said A.B. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we definitely agree on that. Although Cole started off a little rocky because he was taking us through the old Dale Beckham and he was trying to help him with the highlights, but it wasn't working, man. He he knew he was being biased. He was tripping, man. But speaking of Julio Jones and the Atlanta Falcons, now, legendary Falcons quarterback Matt Ryan says he expects to announce his retirement sometime in the next couple of weeks, which means that he's not going to play anymore. Thank God, because he looked bad with the Colts. But just to go over his resume, and I wrote this down. I wrote this stuff down because this is what the article said. 
when it says it's been one hell of a career for Matty Ice. So his resume reads NFL MVP 2016. He's a four time pro bowler, one time all pro first team all pro. He's 2016 offensive player of the year in the NFL 2008 rookie of the year. Passing rating leader in 2016, completion percentage leader in 2012. He's got 5,551 completions on 8.464 attempts, whatever that means. 381 touchdowns, 62,992 yards, passing yards. NFL passing rating leader in 2016. And my question to you guys on the panel, and we'll start with you this time, Cole, first. Is he a Hall of Famer in your eyes? I think he's a Hall of Famer, but I put him on the level of uh, Jim Kelly. You know, mm. Like, when I think of Matt Ryan, I think of, like, Jim Kelly. I think of... Mm. You, know, just, you think he's that good? I mean, Jim Kelly was good. I, I think... That, to me, I, I think they, they're good. they just not... It doesn't I, you yeah. just you, you use Jim Kelly and I think I could give you that in terms of the skill set maybe but Jim Kelly I mean he took four straight years four straight years but oh. people forgetting that 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 even those four straight years the back of quarterback uh for like two of those playoff years played most of those games up until the Super Bowl Arguably, right. but you can't take away the work he did in the regular oh, season. No, no, no. I can't take away the work, but I still don't think that – I think he's also a product of having all that talent on that team. Bruce Smith, Reed, Tally, Tasker. Uh, I, th- I think that Herman. sometimes we, we overrate. Like, when I think Matt Ryan, I think of Kurt Warner. I think of Jim Kelly. I think of even uh, Steve McNairish. Like, Whoa, wait, 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 Cole. <laughs> slow down. I'm serious. Slow down. I'm serious, though. Steve McNair was like Warren Moon. I think those are nice quarterbacks. I think when it went so, so if y'all want to talk elite, I'm talking more like Patrick Mahomes. I'm talking wait, about uh Montana. I'm talking about Steve Young. I, I feel like he's on that tier of good, really good quarterbacks, but he's not on that upper echelon. All right, peace, Steve McNair, man. Shout out to Steve McNair, man. Steve and McNair. Steve family. McNair's on the same level as those Randall Cunningham's and stuff like that. Like great. These are facts. The way we talking about Maddie Ice, Matt, well, Maddie Water, really. <laughs> That's su- one Super Bowl. You are gonna compare him to Jim Kelly, which is not fair. <laughs> I thought that was a little bit unfair too. I did too. I mean, I they dominated the AFC yeah, for I four seasons. Nobody yeah. has accomplished but that's a team, that. though. That's a team. Like they had well, you know dominant. What? Put it team. this way: this is true, and the, and and there's the next man up mentality even back then. But it's like the feat hasn't really been accomplished. I don't think by any quarterback. Ain't I mean, did Tommy and them win four in a row? Ever at any point? Because uh, the I fact that he lost four, them, it might have went to four Super Bowls in like four out of five years or something. The same thing with uh, Patrick Mahomes. But but let's just be fair though. It, 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 and to to Larry's to to Laro's point, I mean, it, you can't. I get what you're saying, Cole. You make a fair point when you talk about Buffalo. Like that was a great team. But all but, these but, comparisons but are still... unfair. And all these comparisons are unfair. It's like, shit, no, he don't deserve the, the whole <laughs> career. I mean, I, I'm sorry, Matt. Like, you definitely not first ballot for sure. It's like you had a run. You weren't, you, you weren't by far the best quarterback in your era. You're, you're, you're 28 26, to 3 you're, versus you're, the Patriots, fam. You feel me? 28 to 3. You ran it up on the Patriots and could not close the deal. That was for that will forever be your albatross. You That's burned over. He crashed and sure. burned over that. When I think of you, I think of an epic collapse. Yeah. Atlanta's you know, only first ballot Hall of Famer. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Even 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 statistically. Yeah. Like it's it's like you make him wait. They they showed him love. All, all this happened in the 2016 season. Pretty that was much. the peak of what he had going on. In, 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 and, it was, and it ended in an epic collapse. He was never the same. Nothing about him was ever the same. I mean, he was already skittish as it was. And teams were winning out of that, out of that NFC, out of the South. You know, it's like Atlanta really needed to. So, so, so just to go back, Cole, Cole, what would be your case for him being in the Hall of Fame? Is it is it, it it can't be longevity? Are you saying is it the dominance? Because most of his body of work was done between his rookie year, which was you got 
2008, he was rookie of the year. And then 16, like much like Laro said, is when he did most of his work. Um, and 16, I think that's when they went to the Super Bowl. Correct me if I'm wrong. He was the NFL MVP. His passing rating, he was a passing rating leader. Um, 16 was his monster year, which well, I, my, I go ahead. My so question your case. This would be your case for him. What would be your case for him being a Hall of Famer? I don't think he's in the Hall of Fame yet, but if y'all say that this person deserves to go to the Hall of Fame, then this is my case why he deserves to go. Is Tony Romo a Hall of Famer? No, definitely not. not. Yeah, definitely, definitely not. not. Definitely not. I don't oh, think nobody ever said not that. Even statistics. That's, 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 that's weird that's, because I was going to say he's better than Tony Romo. So true. But, but you, but you I, apparently had to say you said, and to your credit, you said. He may not be first ballot, but he he should get in. What what were you actually thinking? It was it really because of Romo? If Romo got in, you were thinking something. No, no, no. I actually think when I think about a list of players who possibly might go on, like Eli Manning, I don't know if Eli Manning's naturally better than Ryan. I think what he will get Skill Eli set. in is that right. he won the Super Bowl. Right. Skill did set. he win the Super Bowl because of him, or did we win the Super Bowl because the Giants actually had the most dominant pass rush that's that we've probably seen yeah. in, in, in our age? You know. So. But it's debatable for Eli because he does have the body of work as far as accomplishments. See, when you start Damn. talking about Hall of Fame, that's why I ask you what sticks out about Matty Ice because he had defenses as well. He right. had some tremendous defenses in Atlanta huh, that really put that they, that that year that right. that twenty sixteen season. Was a hell of a they team. had an excellent uh, and, and see and that's the thing about that he had a monster year in sixteen. I'm not doubting that. I just don't think that's enough work. For what he did, for what he's done, I mean, the strongest attribute for him to be in the Hall of Fame was just that year, NFL MVP. And I'm assuming this one time first the reason team, Julio didn't work out, right? Like, think right. about all the time he wasted. Think of his right. his main target, right? It was uh, Roddy, uh, Roddy, Roddy White. White. He, he wasted so many. Right, and then, receivers time. I mean, I guess 2016 would also include. 2016 was offensive player of the year. I'm going to assume that first time, first team all pro was probably that 16 year. Um, and then you had the epic collapse in the Super Bowl. So if you're going to say he's a Hall of Famer, you would point to one particular season, which is 2016. Now, he was dominant. He to was Cole. a decent quarterback, not a Hall of Famer. Well, in the body of work, yes, he was a decent quarterback. But in 2016, he was dominant. You know what I'm saying? As far as what he did. To me, that's not enough work. He was four time Pro Bowler, one time all pro and an offensive player of the year. That's that's, that's it's solid. Yeah, numbers. it's solid. But is it that's is Hall it, of Fame though? But is it is that enough? Four Pro Bowls, one offensive player of the year and rookie of the year, and a one time first team all pro. I well, see, see, you it. confuse me I because see, see, for me, you it's too bad to Kurt Warner. Right. To, it, it, to me, it's this number one. Okay, it's like, and, I, and I'll liken this, and it's a different sport, but I'm going to use this example. This might not be strong or not, but if we're going to sit here and say Penny Hardaway, who also had four great years in the NBA, and me and you agree, Cole, that it's not enough for the Hall of Fame. And we can attribute that to that his downfall being injuries. I could Matt say Ryan, a, better exa- a better example would be Derrick Rose. I wouldn't even say that because even it's not a better example to me. Just subjective because Derrick Rose was dominant. But like he won, he won MVP. He yeah, won but he had. A, I think he, I have. I think he still had more body of work than Matt Ryan. I only look at rap, my, rap, Matt. This is my point. My opinion. I only look at Matt Ryan for that year, that historic year in sixteen, and that's because he did. He dominated. But other than that, and I think maybe I'm speaking for Larry. Or Larry, you correct me or not. But after that, that whole thing went down, and I feel like he was the catalyst in Atlanta. I feel like everything – Larry talked about wasting careers with Roddy White and Julio, and Julio had injuries. I get that. but He's a part of the GOAT story. Right. He's, he, he's a part of Tom Brady's legacy. He, that, that is forever who he will be cemented as. He as. I just think, and you make a. I understand what you're saying, Cole. Not everybody, not everybody gets rookie of the year. Not everybody gets offensive player of the year, NFL MVP, four time Pro Bowl. I get that. I just don't think it's enough body of work. And then think about how his career ended in Indianapolis. He looked so bad. He looked like a king when he went to the Raptors. 
Goodbye, you know, bad Akeem you know, look. And then when 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 Patrick Ewing went to Seattle, Seattle Orlando, a lot of people don't even know he played for the Seattle Supersonics. That's how bad it was. Is Philip Rivers going? I think it's a case for him to go over Matt Ryan. I like him to go over Matt Ryan. I too. think it's a case, yeah. Even yeah. though I mean he's got NFL, I think this maybe it's the longevity. That's what I'm saying. For a long that's time, what I'm saying. Know. For Hall of Fame, something has got to stand out. And other than one season, I don't think you can get in on one season's work. That I, you I just lost feel like in. that yeah, you lost in. Exactly. Exactly. Like I mean, everybody has a. I ain't gonna say everybody has a dominant season, but it's like it's only one season for me with him. He just doesn't have enough for me. But I mean, I get what Cole is saying. That four-time Pro Bowler, NFL MVP. Rookie of the year, offensive player of the year. That jumps off, but I just say nay. I say nay. All right, let's get down. Speaking of Hall of Famers, this is fun to me because I never really understood. I never really could answer the question to this debate, but shout out to my man Keyshawn Johnson on the on his new podcast called All Facts, No Breaks. Go check that out. But the question came up. He asked Jerry Rice, who are you taking? Because Jerry Rice played with both. Joe Montana versus Steve Young. So, Ro, let's go with you first, man. Who are you taking and why? Joe Montana versus Steve Young. I'm taking Joe. Joe Cool over Steve Young. That's that, that's what I grew up looking at, man, was Joe Cool doing his thing and that particular type thing, uh, you know. So would you say you biased? Steve, I, I think so because Steve Young more so – with that West Coast style offense, you know, he he ran the West Coast offense to a T with that implementation. So he goes with that whole area. So taking nothing away from him, he's tremendous as well. However, when I think of the GOAT, that was my GOAT before Tom Brady was the GOAT. So it's like I got to rock with Joe Montana, to be all the way honest. Like not no disrespect to Steve Young at all. I mean, it, him, him being part of Jerry Rice's legacy is – as epic as it comes anyway, but that's also part of Joe Montana's legacy. So, right. I mean, that being the test, it was interesting. He was asked that question. I really would like to hear what he said Which, in response. And then it, well, to kind of sum it up, Jerry said this. He said they both were great. He said he's going to ride with Joe. And what he was, what he kind of, what he kind of based it on was he was saying that him and Joe Montana had a better relationship. And the fact that Joe Montana, they had better chemistry. They spent more time together. They came up together. And so that chemistry that he got between him and Joe was, was priceless. And he also said in terms of Joe didn't run that much, but he put the ball where Jerry was supposed to be. He said he said that that Joe pretty much helped him on his route run and putting the ball where he's supposed to Made be. him the route run he was. Right. Yeah. And he said no disrespect to Steve, but Steve, because he ran so much, he might take off. You know what I'm saying? Which still attributed to them winning, but he said he had more chemistry with Joe. But I thought it was a good question because it's like both were great quarterbacks to me. But, Cole, hearing what you say about quarterbacks, I was really, really interested to hear what you said about this because I know you like different quarterbacks. I know you like different skill sets. Thinking back to those days when Joe Montana was in the 80s and Steve Young was more in the 90s, what would you prefer with all your based on your football knowledge now? Who would you go with? Those is my Tecmo Bowl years right there. Right. Um, I'm going to say I'll probably go with Steve Young. And I, and, and I think the that. reason being is he's a, he's a lefty. He's, uh, he, ushered, he helped usher in the mobile quarterback. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's I very accurate. Huh? I said I figured you would say that. That's why I was thinking about you with this question. He's he's very accurate. He's just he's just as much a winner as, as Joe Montana. Um in, in regards to I think what he won two Super Bowls. I think Joe so. might have won way more, like maybe four, or, four or five or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they both had three. They both no, had Joe three. Got Joe got four. Joe got I think Joe, yeah, either four or five. Yep. Yeah. I just think that uh I just like the versatility of Steve Young a little bit more, but I I I truly love Joe Montana. Like I, I have nothing bad to say about him. I just think that mobile quarterbacks is a is a right. is a benefit, right. you know, when it comes to being an overall player. That says that hey, I'm not just one dimensional, and you could be super great one dimensional. Look at Tom Brady, super great one dimensional, and I will argue a lot of times: is he really the best, or has he played on the best team? And so right, I, right. I give it to Steve Young for me, like overall as a talent level. 
Right, 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 right. And and that's what I, I it, it's funny, both of y'all answered it exactly. That's exactly why I was having a debate with myself. And this is like, because the thing about Joe Montana is this, when you talk about being able to, to, to play under pressure, when you talk about being able to make the right play at the right time, the right throw, um, nobody does it better. Like Larry said, arguably he was my GOAT. You know, even when I think about him and Brady, it's still tight for me. But because I was so biased, and that's why I asked Larry that question about being biased, I was so biased to Joe Montana and San Francisco 49ers. It's one of my favorite teams of all time. And so my first question to myself when I was debating this is like, it's like, man, Joe Montana had, I think Jay, no, was it? No, it wasn't Jay number check. It was Brent Jones, Jerry Rice, John the Taylor. Clark. The, 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 the famous, the catch, the white Clark. Right, the white Clark. Oh, no. um, you know, he had arguably one of my favorite players of all time, Ronnie Lott on defense. I mean, Dion you had a, came out there. And then ball, Dion man. came with Steve and them. Oh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. like that. Those 49ers teams, those 80s teams were just legendary. Mm-hmm. So I asked myself the question, kind of like, you know, was it the team? Because they had such a great team. Roger Craig was on that team. Um, they, it was just a monument. Like, that's arguably that, – those teams, if I could if I could really look at it, they could compete with the 85 Bears to me. <clears throat> so dig run- this, dig this. Career, Joe, Joe Stats versus Steve Young Stats, right? We got games played, Joe 192 to 169. This is good the important stats. Completions. Joe Montana got 3,400 completions compared to 2,600 completions. Which some would some would argue it's more he games. On the bench. Yeah. yeah. Steve was a Steve started off as a backup quarterback. Um, did Steve Young have a Brent Jones? But did see Steve, how the durability suffers. The Steve Young of- had, he had, you know. Jerry, Jerry Rice. Rice, he had Terrell Owens, he had Merton Hanks. But Terrell he Owens had, what, what, wasn't what we, he became yet. Well, you could say no, John Taylor. T.O. Like was, yeah, T.O. San Francisco years yeah. were insane. Yeah, but, insane. But, you, but you could give a lot of that credit, too. You got to remember, you got to give a lot. See, here's the thing. Ricky Waters, like they had a squad. Yeah, bro. but you got to remember, though, Terrell Owens, the, his ascension was still Jeff Garcia was tied to that. It wasn't so much Steve Young. Steve Young was Dion. Ricky Waters, Jerry Rice on the tail end of his career with San Francisco, John Taylor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Compare that. T.O. was coming in on the backside of when Steve Young was there. Okay. But compare that to what Joe mm-hmm. Montana had. That's why I say it's a debate because Joe Montana has so many. Steve great got players. a higher touchdown percentage. He got fewer interceptions. He got a higher longest pass. Higher average Pass attempt. That's why I say it's a debate. Yeah. Because higher yards per right, completion. Right. And again, no higher di- quarterback rating. Right. You got it for 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 those who like Cole. For those who are going for Steve Young, you say. First of all, Steve Young came in off the bench behind Joe Montana. So much of his career, not much of it, but the first part of his career, he wasn't a starter. Mm-hmm. All right. And he ended up becoming something great. Um. But can if you had the team, and when I say team, like don't get me wrong, Steve Young's 49ers were great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they weren't great compared to Joe Montana's, but you had Ronnie Lott on Joe Montana's team. You had Merton Hanks. Um, I think you had Tom. Merton was on both teams. Who? Merton Hanks. Yeah, but again, again. Now he got chips with both of them. But again, it's also the production, too, because Merton Hanks, much like Jerry Rice, they was coming into the sunset of their career. If you look at the peak of those 49ers games with, with, with Joe Montana, I mean, Ricky Waters wasn't Roger Craig. Oh, no, no. You know what I'm saying? Yo, and that's to the strength of what Cole was saying. Yeah, I was take my ball with Roger Craig, and I'm like exactly. unstoppable. You exactly. Know I mean? Now, if you yeah. for if you for Joe Montana, you still point to the fact that all that greatness had to start with him as a quarterback. And his body of work was just better in terms of, you know, yards and everything we just said, statistically, statistically, I cannot say that sometimes. But if you Steve Young, and I'm going to ride with Steve Young because that's my biggest knock on Brady. I just love athletic quarterbacks. I love athletic quarterbacks. Um, 
a left hander, and I feel like Steve Young had to do more because I think I don't think his team was quite as great as Joe Montana's. But arguably, and I'm kind of contradicting myself, Joe Montana is one of my greats. But I just, for me, Steve Young, it was just a breath of fresh air, him and Ron, Randall Cunningham, because mm-hmm. what they did for me was not only Tecmo Bowl, but it's like playing in the streets of Bridegate. Mm-hmm. He was like the man after like 10 alligators. Cole, I don't know if you know what alligators <laughs> are, do you? Y'all don't have it in New York. Nah. Y'all, y'all ain't got no grass, so y'all couldn't play football out there in the street. <laughs> you got Central Park, man. Yeah, exactly. But y'all, you know brothers can't play football in, in Central <laughs> Park, man. Like, stop it, man. It's okay. It's just where y'all from, y'all. I mean, concrete jungle. But, see, in Brygate, we used to play football. Two hands touch below the waist, and the grass, tackle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, touch on the concrete, and tackle then, the grass. when the quarterback would say hike, whatever we make up, you had you had one dude standing right there counting alligators, Cole. One alligator, ten out, two alligator. When you get to ten, the guy could rush you. Mm-hmm. So you're standing back there, and if you couldn't run, you wasn't no good. So when I seen Steve Young, I was like, yeah, it's like playing alligators. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> One alligator, two alligators. So to your point, Cole, I never thought – I thought Joe Montana was here. I was like, mm-hmm. man, Steve Young made me feel like I probably can play quarterback because I can run a little bit when they come out them alligators. So for me, I prefer Steve Young because I prefer a dual threat quarterback. No disrespect to Joe Montana. Um, when I start talking about comparisons, I can compare Brady and Joe Montana. Even though with Brady, I'm a little bit biased because I feel like in the league that was so athletic, I felt like for him and Peyton Manning, they made it to where you couldn't hit the quarterbacks to keep them sustained. Can I give a shout out real quick? Yeah. Dig this shout out just because we're on this topic. Shout out to uh, my pastor, Danny Davis. He was the first black quarterback at University of Houston. Right? Mm. Wow. The reason I give him this shout out right now. Is because in 1979, he beat Joe Montana in the Cotton Bowl. That's big. Wow. That's big. That's big. That's for big. U of H. That's big. That yeah. is big. So shout out to you, Pastor. Especially a black quarterback at that time. That was, you know, that's big, man. Yeah, legacy. Mean, yeah, that's legacy. But no, nah, I'm going to roll with uh, Steve Young, man. I'm going to roll with Steve Young just because I just thought it was something new, fresh. And Joe Montana was just like the, the quote unquote, you know, the, the traditional quarterback that didn't run, but no disrespect to Cool Joe. I see why Laro, he was considered one of the GOATs, man. That 40, those 49ers teams to me were some of the best teams I've ever seen with Joe Montana. But shout out to Steve Young and them, man, because they did have the swagger. They had Dion, they had Ricky Waters, you know, they had the swagger. But I'm going to roll with Steve Young on this one. All right, let's get to the association, man, because I've been dying to talk about this topic. I talked about this with Coach Trey Austin. I talked about this with Chuck. Chuck put it in the in the little group text that we talk about. But everybody been talking about Ramadan Kyrie and family to feed Jalen Green for the Rockets because <laughs> both of them been playing well. But my question is to you all, and we'll start with Lara on this one first. Who's been playing better? Now, let's give some stats before we get in here. Jalen Green or family to feed Jalen Green. Shout out to my man. He, you know, he married. I mean, he. He knocked up a chick that was like what 15 years older than oh, him. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm even probably more than that. More yeah. than that. Like yeah. 20 years. And, and here's the funny part. Since he's been doing that, he's been balling. But let's get to so, the, so, so, the, yeah, shout out to the folks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope he can hold it down because it's different dating a 20-year-old woman than a 40-year-old woman. Shout out to my man Family to Feed Jalen. All right. So his stats, Family to Feed Jalen, because he said that. He said, well, they say, why you think you're playing? I got there? a family. I got a feed. family to take care of. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So we're going to call him Family to Feed. Jalen, in this debate. All right, in the last eight games, a credit to the Rockets. They've been on an 11-game winning streak. Since the All-Star break, they've been 14-5. and five. But here is family to feed Jalen's numbers. 30.2 points a game, 6.7 rebounds a game, 4.1 assists a game, 1.2 steals, 0.5 blocks. And I don't even know. I write some of this stuff down sometimes. I don't even know what TS stands for. But that's his numbers. Now, Ramadan Kyrie. No food, plant-based diet, and night. Shout out to my man David Dixon, man, who's a, who who lives in Turkey, man. Shout out to Dave, man. He's going through Ramadan for all y'all going through Ramadan. Allah bless y'all. But anyway, 
Ramadan Kyrie's numbers in 11 games is 24.3 points a game, 4.6 rebounds a game, 6.2 assists a game, 1.4 steals per game, and 2.7 three-point made, 2.7 three-pointers made. So, Ro, you've been watching, you've been hearing. Who's better, family to feed Jalen or Ramadan Kyrie? Man, you know what? That was an extremely difficult question up until my producer told me about what was really, really popping in these streets, man. Um, during the runs, during the, res the respective runs, because Dallas ended ours. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to it's hard to compete with what I, I've seen JG doing, man, with this baby on the way, man. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I mean, we've really had the pleasure of watching him grow up before our eyes. We've known about Kyrie longer. I just, I, I wish I had understood that it took Ramadan to calm Kyrie down and get him into his groove and doing what he's supposed to do and stop running his mouth, you know. But yeah, if, if we're talking about pound for pound run and impact, I got to say that Jalen, Jalen had been the catalyst. Jalen was doing things I hadn't seen him do yet, and I've watched him his whole career. So. Well, I've, I've, I've watched Kyrie as well, and, you know, that's much respect to Ramadan Ree. You you can't go wrong Ramadan Ree, but he's playing with a, a, a white boy right now that we're not going to mention. That. <laughs> hey, Luca, man. Luca Magic, bro. <laughs> oh, my God. Luca yeah. Magic, bro. This guy, you, you know. So, yeah, Jalen Green, bet, better impact over the last 10 games, you know what I'm saying. All right, Cole, what you got? You got family to feed Green or Ramadan Kyrie? I got the family's already fed green. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go with green because I feel like when they when y'all lost y'all center, he stepped his game up. Yeah, he did. He showed up in a big way to say, Hey, I'm gonna put this team on my back to win all these games and just to be competitive in the West, because we already know the West is 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 stacked. And I just think that he's you can see his growth through uh what MA's been able to insert in his confidence and insert in his mindset when it comes to his approach. So I definitely want to say um, I give it to Green also because he really doesn't have another superstar like Luca on the team either. And for him to be the number one option, night in, night out, teams trying to double team you or whatever they do out there to when, when they know you're the only person out there for you to continue to contribute 30 points a game, I got to give him his props. All right, so let me play devil's advocate. Let me play devil's advocate because what I'm hearing is that everybody pretty much is going with and when I say everybody, I think shout out to JT who just walked in too. I see him shaking his head. And then, of course, uh, Chuck agrees as well. But let me play devil's advocate. Many people would say with Green, the counter to that argument is this. A lot of people are giving a lot of credit to Udoka. And what we mean by that is, and people say, you know, yeah, of course, Green is doing what he's doing. But mainly, it's not just Green. And the Rockets have been on a winning streak. Shout out to them. But a lot of people are attributing that to the shaking up of the lineup that Udoka has done. Mm -hmm. And just the mindset because – and they point to this clip, and one of those talk shows is talking about is when LeBron was talking crazy and Udoka was like, man, you ain't finna do nothing. And so a lot of people think that the Rockets have adopted that attitude in terms of you see the young players kind of pushing other teams around. So some people say – and ultimately, he's responsible for unleashing Green. Then it, exactly the way you do it. It's like some yeah. people say it's Udoka versus Green, but y'all are saying Green simply because he has changed his game. Um, he has increased his productivity. I'm kind of I don't know. I don't think it's that simple, man. Because it's easy to point to Green because he has been the one that's improved the most on the Rockets. I give mm -hmm. you that. And to your point, Cole, the big man is going down. But let me tell you something. Ramadan Kyrie is nice. Now, what I hear from a lot of from both of y'all and a lot of people, and it's a fair point. We've seen this before from Kyrie. We've seen him, you know, go on these runs and all that. But my question to both of y'all, because here's my thing, it's like this. I agree with Chuck, man. And a lot of people don't understand that Chuck just said something that's very powerful. Luca is Magic Johnson. 
Okay. And what I mean by that, triple double king can do anything passing. We've seen Luca do triple doubles within this run that the Mavericks are doing. But even Luca has come out and made the comment, and this came from Luca. I'm Robin. Kyrie is Batman. I would argue Kyrie. I'm leaning towards Jalen because, again, there's a significant change in Jalen's game. And to his credit, it's easy to say that he's had the better run. But if Kyrie Irving ain't there, if Kyrie Irving ain't doing what he's doing, are the Mavericks even contending? Absolutely. Because it's great. It's Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Just based off of Luka? See, this I don't season, know. Bro, this particular I, season? Was that the game last night? You know what I'm saying? I watched and I'm about Luka. to counter that point. Go ahead. I'm, I'm about just to saying, counter that point. I watched Luka Magic score 32 points. I'm with all of that. In the first half, fam. I'm with all of that. Magic Mavericks only had 64. You know what I'm saying? He had half of them. And then when the fourth quarter came, they had 80 something and he had 40 something. I got and then when we got to the that. end of the game, he was at 47. And I was like, okay, so. And to the point of uh, Ramadan Re, Ramadan Re actually had a bad game yesterday. Okay, but I you still got a counter to that. And here's my counter. No, look, and then Luke ain't got to play no defense. All the while, he, he, he's the only super, he does what he wants to do absolutely on the offensive side of the, of the court. On D, they have him, his liabilities perfectly and, disguised. And, and what we all got to remember, <laughs> what we all got to remember about that, those are great points, but you all got also got to remember this now. When you face the Dallas Mavericks, it's not just Luka you got to worry about. Oh, no, hard away. They, they, they defend him. Yeah, they defend him, but you also got to worry about, and that's why I get what Luka is saying. Luka is really understanding it in the sense that I'm robbing because at the end of the day, they can't just concentrate on me. Yeah, I can get a triple-double because they got to make a decision. Now, to your point last night, what you saw, yes. But at the end of the day, it's still the Rockets. No, no I'm, with I, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm no with you, though. No I'm with you, though. But I'm with you. I'm with you because he, 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 he's the reason that Luka looks like this. He's, and you he's gotta, a big part of it. And you got to remember Luka that. Luka was looking like that before the trade, though, fam. But I'm yeah, saying but, the, the but, attention but he, he – Exactly. He, he you got to remember that. It's not about numbers because I get what you're saying. Luka's going to always look like he looked last night. That's what I'm saying. But I'm saying – No Kyrie, you, Kyrie, no yeah, matter. But, I'm but, giving you a triple-double with a 40-piece chicken wing. But we also understand this, though. Just like last year and years before, they always get to the first round and they lose – and that's Luca carrying them on their back. Oh, yeah, that just changes about, this year. Just think about how, how scary it is now when you got both of them to worry about. And see, that's what I'm saying. To y'all point, y'all making a great point about numbers. I'm talking about what you facing every night. Mm -hmm. Because even though Kyrie has a bad night, you still got to worry about because the thing, and I tell people this about Kyrie Irving, what you, what you got to remember about Kyrie Irving is everybody needs to be thankful that he's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100, yeah. Because Thanks. I'm not taking a call of his shot. Okay, he's out. You know what? I feel like being on a podcast with a Washington, D.C. politician. I'm walking around Boston Garden with Sage. Well, guess what? Kyrie ain't playing. Because if he played... <laughs> <laughs> and he said, you know what? I'm just going to concentrate on basketball. We should be thankful that he's kind of crazy and kind of yeah, off. They had a chip in Brooklyn. Yeah, exactly. Even then, because at the end of the day, that's what, that's his only weakness. Like, the only way you can stop him is if he have a moment. I can dig it. In, in that, you know what I'm saying? In, like, in that he's settling in exactly. is the scary part about exactly. what's going and, on. And, yeah. and, and I think and that's why, yeah. and that's why that, I yeah. think Dallas mm -hmm. is doing so well because for the first time in a long time in his career, he's there mm -hmm. and he's concentrating on basketball. He's happy. You're right. Well, he's and, 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 and the team supporting him. Exactly. He came out and said that. Exactly. Like, and, and here's yeah. the thing. Like Kendrick Perkins said, shout out to Big Perk. This is what's scary about him. He's settling in. He got Ramadan. They bringing him his meals. But when's the last time you seen him? It scared me when I saw him catch an alley two weeks got ago. Got up, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. So that lets me know Uncle that Drew his mind good. is on basketball. 
Okay, Drew as great as good. he plays, Uncle Drew feeling good. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So for me, numbers wise, it's Jalen Green. Numbers wise, his game has he has stepped up, and shout out to him and, and, and Coach Adoka. But it's scary to me. I know Luca gonna do what you saw with Luca last night. I think he can do that any given night. But even Luca acknowledged it. And if you think about when you go against the Dallas Mavericks now, what do you do? Yeah, you can't do nothing. All you can hope for is the supporting cast and not making open shots. Because when you got a concentrated Ramadan at Kyrie on top of uh, Luca, who I think, no disrespect to Anthony Edwards, I think it should be out of Luca and the kid from Oklahoma City. Now, I know everybody loves Anthony Edwards, but if you think about what Luka Doncic is doing and you think about the kid from Oklahoma they City. him number one now. There is no Rudy Gobert or Cat there, you know, and, and Anthony should be in the conversation, but to me it's out of Luka and the kid from Oklahoma City. It's scary in terms of that, and you got to focus Kyrie because you got to remember this about Kyrie, man. Like, there is nobody. Even the legends have acknowledged there is nobody with that kind of skill set other than a Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, where there is nothing he can't do on the floor. You know what I'm saying? He's just 6'2", and he's crazy. That's why I say everybody should be happy that he's when he's crazy. Like, he might not be there. I'm not taking a Kobe shot. I'm observing. I'm doing I'm, – I'm signing. I'm going to an orphanage in Baltimore to help them, so I'm taking a league of absence. But now we seeing when he catching alley hoops and dunking. I don't know. I'm a ride with Ramadan Kyrie, man. No disrespect to my home brother. But with that being said, let's go to the next point. Cole. Oh, so you just on clear on that question, you riding with Ramadan I'm going Ramadan. And you had you had uh feed the fam. Yeah, I'm, and I'm Cole had feed, feed the fam. Yeah, I'm going But Ramadan. you know what? I'm reversing course and then racking with because of the effect. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like you got to look seeing at him effect. down the line. That, I mean, I mean, the last thing the league needed was for Ramadan and Luca and, and, and Luca Magic to really find that synergy because it's like because here's the thing. This is the first time where we've seen Luca be like, "Oh, I could take a breather. It ain't all on me now." Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, man. But with that being said, Cole, let me ask you this. Which current NBA duel do you think is the best? And the numbers that are next to this, speaking of Luka and Ramadan Kyrie, but the numbers that are next to these choices in parentheses are the points averaged by the duel. So number one is Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, averaging 59.2 points a game. B, the second choice is Giannis and Dame Leonard at 55.1 points. C, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker is 54.8. D, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, which is one of Cole's favorite duels at 50.7. And then E, LeBron James, Anthony Davis at 50. Now, these numbers that are on the side, again, are the points averaged by the duel. So, Cole, who do you think is the best duel right now currently in the NBA out of these choices? I think you got to go with the team who got the best record in the NBA with Boston. And I also think the fact that they both will play he defense. He goes and they, bo does. they both will play defense. So... I think all the mother tandems, I don't think everyone plays defense. I think they, they can score a lot here and there, but I also think they haven't been consistent, none of those other tandems either. Great, fair point. Fair point. I mean, he's been riding with Tatum, and I got to give him that. Ro, what you think? Yeah, me and Cole pretty much in agreement. I, I take Brian and, Anthony, and, and AD just as in, in terms of – the, the favorite duo because it's like yeah they're only they're, they're the only other defensively anchored you know duo, uh, duo on there because it's like Giannis is shackled with Dame because Dame don't hold nobody you know it's like bless <laughs> you know I, I, I like that duo a lot you know and it's like the same with the Kyrie Luca you know uh, Luca don't they they've disguised Luca back there Luca don't have to do nothing but go mm -hmm. and create. Get, get a couple defensive rebounds, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, yeah, JT and Jalen Brown rocking, but, you know, I, 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 I rock out West. You know, my, my team out West, so I rock out West. I, I take Brown and AD. Oh, so you taking Brown and AD? Mm hmm Okay. I, I think they need to trade AD before they, they lose total value with him. I think he's the biggest bust. That he's stealing money. He's robbed the Brinks truck. He did all that, yo. He's a, he's a freaking burger to me now, yo. 
always injured, always disappearing. This is a, he's a magic. He, man, he's a <laughs> that's his nickname. I'm calling him a magician. Yo, always disappearing. Yo, always disappearing. Yo. That's a fair point. Yeah. It's a fair point. Both of y'all make fair points, man. Golly, <laughs> boy, Kobe and Kodo hold no, back, man. Yeah, he, he, no shout, yeah, shout out to both. What Buckley call him? Plain clothes yeah, or something like yeah, that? Street, street clothes. <laughs> Street clothes, street clothes, yeah, plain clothes. Plain yeah, clothes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's hard, man. God. He frustrates me, man. I don't like Davis, man. Like he just frustrates me. But you know the funny part about it, and this is this is to add to what you're saying about frustration about him is that I watched them last week play the the Milwaukee Bucks without LeBron, and they won that game. They went into overtime, and Giannis and and Dame were playing great. AD had a huge game. He had a huge game, and that's the frustrating part about it because I, I'm sitting there saying to myself, if he if he would just do what he's capable of doing, I still think he's arguably the best player in the league. And people get mad about that, and I understand that. But watching that game, no LeBron with Giannis, Dame Leonard, all of them going full speed. And I'm not just talking about points. I'm talking about defensively. Mm -hmm. He changed the scope of that game. You know what I'm saying? But, again, he's just not consistent. But it's arguable. Like, even – like, he, he gave Giannis problems. And even, even Jokic, because Jokic is not as athletic as him, he gives Jokic problems. But, again, you don't know who's going to show up when it comes to him. So, mm -hmm. with that being said, um, the only thing I don't like about Tatum and Brown, I've told Cole this, is just the epic – and they're young. They're young players. But the epic for Tatum, man, the, the the disappearing acts in the playoffs. Because I could argue sometimes what Anthony Davis does in the regular season, Jason Tatum does in the, in the postseason. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, to Cole's point, I do think they, they are the most well-rounded duel, meaning that they will play defense. Um, it's rough for me because at, at the end of the day, I get what Cole is saying. I do get what Cole is saying. I do get what Cole is saying. That's why I would say I'm kind of with both of y'all, D and E, because, again, as much as I like what Luke and Kyrie is doing right now, how much longer until these two des decide they're going to play defense? I know Kyrie can play defense. Um, with Giannis and Dane, I just think they need more time. Durant, you know how I feel about Durant, Cole, Booker, to me, it's just it's it's another scoring duo, so probably it would be out of D and E. I'm gonna say consistent wise, it would be Tatum and Brown. I want to say if if I had to bet, if Anthony Davis would show up, to me it's LeBron and Anthony Davis. Mm -hmm. You know, but again, you don't know who's gonna show up for Anthony Davis, so you don't know if it's gonna be Casper the Friendly Ghost or the Bubble Anthony Davis MVP Anthony Davis. So I gotta go with you, Cole. I get it, the most well-rounded. Um, but we'll see, man. It's, I mean, I hey, to me, I Boston is in the playoffs, to be honest with you. I have the Lakers. They could. They could. They could. Well, they I'm, could. I'm, I'm saying it here today. They will miss the playoffs this year. It's a lot of hatred coming from over there. All right, let's wrap up. Let's get a couple more uh, topics, and then we get out of there. All right, Cole, you know I had to do this. I got this down as optional, but I think it's time. Will or should the Warriors ultimately move on from Draymond Green after the ejection for arguing with the official at Orlando? Should the Warriors be at their breaking point with this young man? Let's start with you, Ro. And and I'm only saying this because did you all see how Steph looked when he went? When, when, oh, when, hard, bro. He was yeah. destroyed. He was, and I've he never was seen so him like that. You know what I'm saying? But it, it should it even be – should it be in discussions right now with the Warriors? It should be, but I don't think they should move on. You don't I, think so? I, they, the, the window is too narrow to really rock the boat like that at this particular point. I mean, it's like it's, to do that is to really kind of go into almost a full rebuild, and it's like you don't really have many options. To you, I mean, th there aren't many variations of that. But let me play devil's advocate. Let me stop on that because mm -hmm. most people are saying this. Clay is definitely on a decline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Your future guy that you was counting on, Jordan Poole, you had to get him out of town after the Draymond incident. You chose to ride with Draymond. Mm -hmm. um, other than Steph, Clay, and Draymond, the, the whole the, the whole supporting cast is new players. And so 
a lot of people say, and again, this is against what you're saying. That's why I'm playing devil's advocate. A lot of people are saying how much longer because Clay's influence is not there anymore. Draymond, I mean, what he does, is it special according to Cole and people that believe in him? Yeah. But what does he really do that really you can count on, whether it be statistic-wise or even just pro productivity-wise, that, that you can say is going to help you get to a championship that you can't replace? I know that's a lot mm -hmm. that I'm saying. And so the Warriors are not the – for the four horsemen warriors those no. days are over with and everything is riding on Steph everything is riding on Steph even as far as keeping him in the playoff race right now and other than that you got young players so again and I'm just playing devil's advocate people are saying Steph chooses to ride with Draymond that's why he was disappointed I mean as, 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 I mean Ultimately, being the end of this particular year, because I think I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna move him, do you? How else do you craft a team around Steph? Like we talked about last week with Isaiah Thomas, Steph is not the point guard of that team. You know what I'm saying? Is mm -hmm. how do you craft? Do you waste that much trying to build another roster or another offense similar to this? Around. I mean, how many other guys can you go out and get and implement, you know, right off the bat? It's like, right. I mean, you re he's really irreplaceable at this point. It's as much his era and his run as anybody else, effectively, True. even Clay. You know what I'm saying? Because Clay just knocked down shots, you know. I mean, Clay had been on the decline since mm -hmm. the winning years, you know. I mean, Draymond – has had a different kind of decline, but I think that's because his contribution changed and this it, it evolved, you know, you know and, and it's, it, he's really kind of irreplaceable at this particular point unless you're ready to blow it all the way up. You're already, like, you, it's an interesting point. You already sent the future, so to speak, away in Jordan Poole. You know, I mean, you, you made your bed, you got to lay in it, man. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. he's a nutcase. At, at least... He's willing to cooperate and acknowledge what he's done. So I think you can move forward from here in this small little window of time you got remaining. Cole, really what do. you think? Because I want to I want to address that. That's a good point that 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 Lyra brought up. What do you think? Do you think they should start thinking about moving on from Draymond? I think it's time for Golden State and Lakers to blow it up. And then we're gonna. I'm gonna stick with the topic that you don't know. I'm gonna stick with Golden State. Um, we'll get to the chat too. I just think that they're stuck. Like I, regardless if they bring everybody back, yeah, they'll win. You know, forty games, forty-five games, but they're nowhere near the top five teams. Like Memphis is coming back; they're not going to be better than Memphis when John Morant come back healthy. Uh, the power forward that they just got back from Achilles' uh, injury, and then they're going to get another lottery pick. And that Memphis is going to be top five. Minnesota is going to be top five. OKC going to be top five. Right. Said, uh, the Kings are going to be right there, depending on what Phoenix wants to do. Phoenix could actually trade one of the big three and add value to the team by making a, a better bench and still having two quality stars, you know? So, and then you still got Denver, <laughs> you know? Like, you got New Orleans too. You New Orleans, Orleans is too. Houston so in, is my, in my opinion, blow San it up now. Yeah. yeah, San Antonio. Look, look at, look at, look at, uh, what you call it too? Houston's going to be there next year too. So I would, I would honestly blow it up. Get rid of Clay, get rid of Draymond, keep Kuminga, keep uh, Curry. Maybe try to say Clay, Draymond, and your lottery pick this year. Try to bring someone like a Zach Levine, someone who's young, who could create a shot for himself, take some pressure off Steph towards the end of the games while you still have Kuminga, who's developing, and then uh, bringing some free agents that can bang and get rebounds. And you, you have enough, you'll be more competitive with a Zach Levine, to be honest with you. All um, right, so, so let me just say that to both of y'all, both of y'all, because this is worth the debate. And, and Cole, I love the way you break down an analysis because what Cole just did was, is as a GM, you're looking at the Western Conference and you're saying to yourself, if you're the if you're the Warriors, can we compete? The scope of the West is changing. That's a great point. But to what Laro was saying, and I want to harp on this because it's a great point, and we got to remember this. The Warriors hitched themselves to this ride. Now, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, Steph Curry has hitched his wagon to Draymond. 
And I think the only reason why Draymond is still there is because Curry wants him around for whatever mm-hmm. reason. For whatever reason. So what Larry is saying is, is, is it's kind of like I understand exactly what he's saying because for whatever reason, he wants him there. Mm-hmm. And just based on it, and I'm just basing on what I see. Because for me, and I've told you this, Cole, and, and shout out to George Simpkins because he's saying, and I'm going to speak to this in the chat, he says, how effective is Draymond without the greatest shooting backcourt? And that's what I kept telling you, Cole. He can be replaced for what he does. And what I mean by that, Draymond, is that statistically there is nothing there that shows any significance that shows him causing you to win statistically wise. There are no numbers. Now, Cole will counter and say what he brings to the court can't be measured in stats. I get that. But what I'm saying in terms of it being a business, when I sit down at the table and I'm looking to negotiate with Draymond or thinking about bringing him back, if he wants more money, I'm saying to myself, there is nothing that you bring into me statistically that says you need to be around. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're not – there's nothing I can point to that says because of this, because of that, statistically-wise, we're winning or we're staying in the playoff hunt. But the win and loss column. And, again, that's he arguable. Doesn't play, but his country – like, think about it. Hit per minutes on the floor, wins and losses. They are in the playoff. I mean, I think they got the rem- – were, the, they made, were they one game up? They in the play-in. They in the play-in because the Rockets are right behind them. Mm-hmm. And see, and that's my point. One more year, but going forward, but see, that's that's, that's what I'm saying. And my point is that if we were in the top five in the West, if we were shooing, I would say, yeah, whatever he's bringing to right, them right. is is running, is is happening. Mm-hmm. Now he's getting kicked out of games. They're barely in the playoff race, and for whatever reason, it's like you got to start to ask yourself because here's the thing: like Cole argued in the beginning. And I'm saying in several episodes ago, what he brings, just like you said, is causing us to win. Well, we're not winning now. We're barely winning. And then not only that, he's getting kicked out of games. So what people are arguing for says it doesn't show up in the stat sheet. Well, he ain't there. Because he's getting kicked out of games. And then it's like some of the things he get kicked out for, it's like, all right, if we was in a competitive game, and it was one or two calls where I could say I could see why he got mad. He got kicked out. But it's like like he got kicked out the other night, the first four minutes, four minutes of the game being a goon. Yeah. And so it makes me wonder, does he even want to play? Because here's the thing. It's not like this game we was playing was a game that was like we're not getting to the playoffs. And then you got kicked out in the first four minutes for what? You see what I'm saying? Now, if we number one in the West, if we Minnesota, if we Oklahoma City, you know, and we went. Yeah. Okay. Like that. that. And that's what I tell people all the time about Dennis Robin and the Bulls. Mm -hmm. If you watch the last dance, Dennis went to Phil Jackson and was like, hey, I need to go to Vegas. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the season, they was like, Vegas? He's like, yeah, I, I, I need to unwind. Well, they let him go because of his contribution Mm -hmm. and they know he was wild Mm -hmm. but at the end of the day mike and scotty was like they was phil was like all right i'm gonna let him go because of what he does Mm -hmm. and you got to give him some slack but he's producing Mm -hmm. what he's doing is directly correlated to us winning when we brought robin over here say what you want he wild he crazy he not gonna take a shower after the game he gonna go party with chicks on the day is off when we want him to rest and come in, he at Hooters. Mm-hmm. But he's giving us 25 rebounds a night. Faithfully, yeah. He's guarding the toughest. <laughs> Automatic. Right. Automatic. And even if it don't show up in the stat sheet, when Scotty was out, we went on the winning streak because Dennis did what he Dennis do. Automatic. So you can accept the antics because he finna go to WrestleMania during the finals, mm-hmm. but he came back and guarded Carl Malone and we won. This Draymond more concerned. That's what I'm saying. What the productivity <laughs> is not added up. Yeah, Draymond doing what we doing. Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then it may be just like, and again, Giannis got his brother on the team in Milwaukee. 
Now, you know, some players are that great. Where they're like, hey, man, y'all want to keep me here? Put my brother. I, I, I give an example. You was here. Y'all was here. The Steve Franchise days. I love Moochie Norris. I want him to come on the show. But we all know Steve was like, y'all want me to stay? I need my partner on the team. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But well, he's winning. Yeah, rocking with my boy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and Mooch came boy. in and he contributed. But we all know Mooch was his partner yeah, from D.C. Yeah, right, yeah, exactly. But Mooch was losing us no games. But we all know mm -hmm. Stevie Franchise was the franchise. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why I think Draymond is sticking around. But I like Cole, his analysis was great in the sense that if I'm going to state, like I got to sit down with, 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 with Steph and say, listen, how you want to finish your career? Like, yeah. we're not going to win. You know what I'm saying? You want to continue breaking records? That's cool, but it's like we're not getting anywhere. Unless unless we are planning on breaking everything up and saying we're just going to ride these years out, let you get your records and all that. But we're not winning with this group. And the common denominator right now, well, in my eyes, is that we got guys on this team that may be over the hill. Not you. You still a franchise player, but you got to open your mind up. If you want any more rings, we're going to have to change some things around you. Now, if you don't, so be it. You know, we have to ride. We're going to ride with you. But I just think it's because the thing about it is Draymond is making it easy for me. It's like you getting kicked out of games that – what you doing that for? See, I think Draymond is perfect for a team that – no, and hold on. Before you get to that, because I knew you was going to try this, and I was waiting for you. Let me say this before you say this, because I know exactly what you're going to say, and this is also my counter-argument to you, because you tried this a, a long time ago, and I'm not going to let you, because you, you fit to try to spin mm -hmm. it like to make it sound like it's really going to work, but it's not going to work. My question is this, and you can answer this for me, too. What does he bring to a team in a trade, Draymond? Because he get ready to say, this is what he finna say. He needs to go to a team where they need a veteran presence and he can teach them how to win. Well, how does he do that, Cole? He's tough. He makes all the right passes. He brings a culture. If you send him to a team like a Sacramento or somebody who needs some toughness, maybe even San Antonio, they can win, which I don't buy. So before I let you... Say what you're going to say. What team does he need to go to? Because I don't think he's worth anything. Because that's the thing. Now so I see what you just them. tried to pull. I see now what you, you just tried to pull. Hold on. You kept him so wrong. What is he going to do for any so, other team? So, so I just want you to know you just tried to pull the eight mile where you tried to say the rap lyrics so that you try to. So I yeah, because I know what you're going to say. I've been in this debate with but, you before. But, but anyway, who, who can what you trade I was going to say, what I was going to say. What team can he go to where he can have a direct impact? I think two needed. teams stand out to me. And you said one of them. And I didn't even think about that. But I'm going to start with my first one, which is I think someone like the Charlotte Hornets. They've been losing for a while. I think that this is a make or break season for LaMelo because if I was them, I'll get rid of him if he if he has another injury prone season, they don't make the playoffs. But I think they need that person who's won chips, someone who's gonna call them out because I think young teams need people that hold them accountable and speak to them a certain way. And I think that regardless of what regardless of what people think about him, he he is he has a, a great basketball IQ. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I come he does have a he does have a great basketball IQ. Number two, because they're on the cusp of coming up, and I think that he'll be better. I think being an enforcer for someone like Wemby would be great. I think that every great big man had an enforcer. Someone when they tried to bully you or someone when they tried to injure you would do the dirty work, and I think that he would do great dirty work next to himself. So. so can I counter that last argument because it makes no sense? First of all, you can't, you can't even be an enforcer in this NBA. So that makes no sense. Nah, you can't. Like, you, you, you can't. If you're being an enforcer, that's what he's getting fined for now is being an enforcer. This ain't the 90s New York Knicks. It's, it's like, all good, dude, though. You're it's all dude. Good. Like, like, like. It's all good. It's, 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 it's trying to respond to this because I'm tired of responding to this. The, yeah, hold on. Oh. He said the Charlotte Hornets. Yeah. So, the Charlotte so, so, Hornets. So, so let me ask you this. When he goes to Charlotte, what is his role again? I'm confused. 
force. I think that one being a leader, teaching them how to be disciplined, how to play a certain way. So how's a guy? Hold on, how's a guy that knows how to be in the culture where he just got kicked out of the game in the first four minutes? How is that discipline? But but he can do that on a veteran team. He knows how he knows he wouldn't do that on a team that lacks veteran leadership. He knows he has to be a greater presence in the locker room. He doesn't need to be a great presence in the team that's already better. He Can you please respond to this? Because yes, I've sir. been hearing this for a long time. <laughs> Draymond needs to sign overseas. You know, Draymond does not belong in the NBA at this particular point of nah, his career. No, nah, seriously. Like his contribution. What is his is, contribution? It's, it's it's a Mark Jackson implementation. I, 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 I mean, I'm, Mark Jackson taught and instilled that before Steve Kerr. I mean, I mean. It's not his basketball IQ because he wasn't necessarily playing this way at Michigan State. I mean, the the fact that he's got tremendously less athleticism now than he had before, I mean, that just kind of speaks. It's, hey, he's a favor. I mean, you, you heard of Moochie. You witnessed Moochie. Mm-hmm. Some boys out there on the love, man. That's what the league is about. And it's, a, it's an association. And that boy is an associate of Stephon Curry, you did, <laughs> and therefore that's as far as it so, goes. You so, know? so, so, Cole, I mean, to interrupt you. So he goes to San Antonio, and he does what with the Spurs? I think he takes, the culture. I think I think he won. He he plays the he plays the toughest big man at the time. You know, I think that he does this. He, he's a great passer. He's a great screen setter. I think that he he calls stuff out. He plays point forward. There's a lot of things that you're – no matter what I say, you're going to hate. But I already know. I hope he gets traded so you can see the, his value for real because I actually think – No, because this is a lot more – I'm actually going to listen to you. He but has, I, he I has need like, this thing. I need I some reference. It's like, okay, let me ask you this. This is what I need. This, he this has this a Josh Hart effect. I think that he could go – I don't even know what that is. So I don't know what that is. But anyway, because Josh Hart still has numbers. But mm-hmm. but 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 he, here's what I want you to do. When we it, by the time the next two shows, I want you to come up with some parameters for me because I don't want to stay on this topic. But come up with some parameters that I could. So if he gets traded, what is it that you want me to say? If he does this, it's successful. Like well, for you, your is, it, is it direct? Like is it a direct correlation to them winning? You're basing it off numbers. I think okay, that so that's what I'm saying. Numbers. Without the numbers, that's what I'm saying. I need you to edu- educate me. How do we know he's successful to another team without numbers? Because I think their their the, their winning numbers will go up. I this think their co- their their confidence, just the style of play, will change. Okay. So a negative cloud in the locker room. I don't think he's a negative cloud. I think that's just the narrative that people are trying trying to paint. You I think, think it's a spin. He's on a veteran team. I think he knows he could get away with certain things. I think players know when they're on certain teams, you can get away with certain things. Like if you're on a bum team, you know you could get away with playing like how how Jordan Poole would be like, I'm not gonna be in the huddle. I'm gonna do this because he's playing the Washington. He ain't gonna come to the Knicks and do that. He know he arguably, no, watch. listen, arguably though, that's when he flourished on those seasons when he was the man. I mean, those were his best years, kind of to be. I mean, statistically. I mean, you talking about Poole? No, no, no. Well, well, the, what Poole ended up becoming, so to speak. That's because the culture of these, the cultures of these places allow for him to act like that. If Draymond goes to a team, he ain't acting like that. If Poole came to the Knicks, he ain't acting like that. If Draymond team. came to the Knicks, he ain't acting like that. Draymond will get banned for stealing on Tibbs. You know what I'm saying? So, Draymond, do you think you think Draymond can help y'all, the Knicks? I think he could. By, by what? What, what, Coach. what would you? What would he? What and y'all in good think? shape. As much as you want to hate, he doesn't do stupid stuff. Outside of his attitude, he doesn't make stupid plays on the court. Like I watch basketball players do stupid ass passes, stupid Wait. ass shots, stupid ass. What Draymond doesn't do. Stupid. No, did it, Cole? Hold on. <laughs> I don't know. No, yeah, I just this, had to stop him. Just, I just had to stop him. He was yeah, going too hard, yeah, man. Like, yeah, you know, think he, about he, it. He, outside he of his attitude. He tell me the time when you see them take an ill advised shot. He just tell, can't tell, tell me. Tell me the time when you see them take an ill advised shot. Tell me the time when you see them make a stupid pass. Like I watched Mark Donovich and, and Alex Burks and on the Knicks do a lot of stupid stuff that I'm like, if you put Draymond here, they ain't doing that. So at least he ain't a liability. I don't see him being a liability on anyone's offense. Right. Okay, I can respect that. That's that's a good. That's a good. I, I can respect that. And my only argument to that, him not being a liability, is the amount of games he was suspended this season. 
But I think that's all part of the culture. It, it, like he could get away with that. It goes to he goes to a new team. He ain't doing that under Popovich. He ain't doing that under Thibodeau. He ain't doing that under Spolstra. He ain't doing that under Doc Rivers. He ain't doing that under certain coaches. He's doing it under Kerr because they all know the dynasty coming to an end. And it's hard for him to swallow to be like, yo, we really ain't that good and we ain't going nowhere. It's and like when you play dudes, it's like when you and, play dudes and, in the gym, right? You play dudes and, 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 and they always call and foul. And they always wish it call because they don't want to hustle because they know they but, but, you know, another, and and another they reason why you, and listen, another reason why you get kicked out of the game is because you know you can't help your team. Like you can't help your team. I don't think anyone can Watch help I that team. Huh? I don't think anyone can help that team. The team is done. The same thing with the Lakers. They both done. The Lakers I mean, I, are done. I really think you should. I really think you should be this guy's agent, and I think you should call the Charlotte Hornets. And I mean, is it the Hornets? Is it what is it? I don't. It's the Hornets okay, now, right? Saving, saving, get him a I think you should call the Hornets I would. and tell I them to Baker Mayfield. All right, and and tell them <laughs> and tell them I want you to and I want you to have me and Laro and everybody at this podcast sitting on the, in, on mute, and I want you to convince them to take Draymond Green. And I'll bet you any kind of money, I'll bet you your plane ticket that they're going to be like, get off my phone. Who are you? And you're a terrible agent. What's today? April 1st? And yes. I'm saying it today. April, all April Fools. And it ain't even an April Fool. That if he leaves the team this year and goes somewhere, that team is going to, their wins are going to increase at least by five to ten. Okay, now. It, no so matter where to, he go. No matter make where sure he go. We, this is live, right? I'm 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 on the store. No this matter time. where he go, and okay. I want a sorry, just like I should have got the sorry for Baker Mayfield too. Wow. Okay. All right. For Baker Mayfield. All right. Let's go to the NCAA tournament, man. This Draymond talk is it, really. I was trying to get the boxing, but I can't believe I spent time talking about this dude. But let's get into it. All right. So, hey Cole, what you got the game on right now, right? They're, they're about to lose LSU. They're down by ten. I Two figured I would. Right, right. All right. Two so with left. that being said, who hey, should... Hey, give me, give me some stats real quick, Cole, mainly on, on, on Reese and on Caitlin. Uh, Reese and Caitlin, it is right now, Reese has tw uh, 17 points, 20 rebounds, four assists. Okay. All right, and so... Clark has 37, seven rebounds, it. and 11 assists. I knew it. I knew it. Because it. it's hard. It, that, that Listen, let me tell you something. It's hard to beat that chick twice, and she was waiting for this game. With that being said, who should be the women's player of the year out of these choices? Cameron Brink from Stanford, Caitlin Clark from Iowa, Juju Watkins at USC, and Paige Bucker at UConn. Let's start with you, Cole. Who's the player of the year for the women's basketball season this year? Out of those choices, don't don't go like don't pull out somebody from Gonzaga or something. I'm, you out. I'm some saying, team. I'm saying, I'm watching this woman and she, ain't no one better than Caitlin Clark out there, man. <laughs> like hands down, this she she she. This is why the big three offered her five million dollars to play because she can ball. <laughs> Hey, Ro, what you think, man? As you, this might yeah. be the this might be the third time you agree with Cole in one show. Yeah, shout out to Juju and what she's doing as a freshman. You know, eventually uh, she will be mentioned. You know, and in, in, in regards in comparison to the female Pistol Pete, but yeah, Caitlin doing it. You know, and Caitlin on yeah, she she on another level. I haven't yeah. seen them do it like that. Five million dollars, five million dollars, yeah. and it, and, you know, and I think. You know, people got to understand this, man. We got to start just because you're a woman. We also got to start putting in the conversation of college basketball players is one of the greatest, not just female. Mel, the records that she's breaking, Pistol mm -hmm. Pete's record. Um, I mean, have we seen anybody do what she's doing within the years she's been in college basketball? I mean, just not just the points, but her influence. Um I mean, even her and the rivalry between her and 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 Reese. And, and Reese, like, I, I hope it spills over to the WNBA because that's what we need. We need rivalries. Like, I go back to when I was teasing Cole early in the in the early in the show. It was like the Elijah one and Ewing rivalry started at Georgetown and Houston, and then it spilled over to the pros. You know, to where it was one of the one of the greatest center battles probably since a Kareem. 
or AKA Lou Alcinder versus a Wilt or Russell versus a Wilt. You know, it started in college. We need that. The women need that. Um, I think it's her hands down, Caitlin Clark, man. And I like I like the kid. I like Brink. I like all these. I think Juju's gonna be a star, especially at the next level, just because of the versatility. And the kid from UConn battling back from the injury. But I just think it's hands down, man. I think if you don't give it to Caitlin Clark, I'd like to understand why you wouldn't give it to mm-hmm. Caitlin Clark. Um But you know, it is what it is. All right, let's talk about the final four, man. I was going to get into my fantasy matchup because I wanted to hear you all's opinion on it. But because I got the monologue on Draymond Green, I wasted time. But let's get to the final four. The final four in the men is set. UConn, NC State, Purdue, and Alabama. All right, who wins and how? Let's start with you, Ro. All right, yeah, well, UConn, I wish I had seen that UConn had such an easy route, you know what I'm saying, to what's going on. And at first, I kind of wanted to see it shape up. Like, I mean, they're going to plow Alabama. That's Either way, that's going to go. Ooh, but, then they going to plow them? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. They, I mean, what are they averaging, uh, 30? I mean, uh, they, they they beating boys by 30. <laughs> They, like, did, they did go into another gear. Though. It's like, I, 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 yeah, I ain't gonna lie. Go ahead. I can't believe I forgot about him. I, yeah. I had Arizona beating him in one bracket or something, something crazy. But then I thought about it and I wanted to see the Klingon Edie matchup, you know what I'm saying, yeah. from, from Purdue until I saw DJ Burns, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When once I saw DJ exactly. Burns in that 6 9 Zebo, uh, I, I, I mean, you know what? He reminds me of a, <laughs> a kid. I, Oh man, he reminds me of so many kids I played with, grew up watching Elijah Wan. That is fantastic. And the thing is, they play suffocating defense, and it's going to be real interesting to see Purdue and North Carolina State and who gets the better of that matchup because Edie is what, 7'4, yeah. 300 pounds? Yeah. And then the kid in North, North Carolina, his, his footwork is so good, and he's so fast at 6'9. And he's black. I mean, I ain't, you can't, you can't right. deny that. That's, that's, that's big. It's yes, big. Right. He will be – I mean, I don't see many people stopping him. He's the biggest secret in college basketball. I mean, they got a lot of grad transfers and, uh, you know, the – You're talking about Burns, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The transfer portal is open or whatnot. But, I mean, this North Carolina State has gotten hot at the right time. That's a great point. And it's really reminiscent of some old Jim Valvano Wolfpack mm-hmm. days. I mean, you, 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 go. you can't ignore you that. Go. And it's like – Good point, I mean, Larry. Because Purdue and UConn look like they want a collision course until I saw that. And – the way they turn that on, I don't know. I mean, I'm like, Dark Horse, I'm looking for maybe North Carolina State to shock the world, maybe. It's a great story to shock the world. It is the run that they're going. Cole, what you got, man? I I, I was leaning towards North Carolina State. I'm not going to lie. Know you always I, I agree with you, Laro, But I'm going I'm to go the other end, and I'm going to tell you why. Because I think Edie, he's on a mission after being eliminated, what, two years in a row? That's one. And 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 another thing is, I really think the refs are gonna go Edie's way. I think they're gonna put yeah, they're gonna put Burns point. in foul trouble. That's a I good think, point. I think they're gonna put Burns in foul trouble. And I think everyone wants to see if the center at Connecticut and Edie how they gonna play against each, play against each other. I got Connecticut winning it all though. I think that they've been there, done it too many times. Under most probably the most underrated college program, to be honest with you. Because you're always getting Duke and Kentucky and 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 in North Carolina getting all the glory, but UConn slowly has a whole bunch of championships, men and women's under their belt. Right. That's right. And then to that, and and I agree with you, Cole. To me, UConn has been the best team all year. Now let me ask you this, and shout out to Coach Trey Austin because we got into a heated discussion the other day, and uh, he's going with Purdue as he put in the chat. Shout out to Trey Austin because he thinks Edie is the best player in the country. Now I disagree with that. I think Edie is the best big man in the country. But let me ask you both. Do you think, Ro, Cole, let's start with you, Ro. Do you think Edie is the best player in the country? Because I don't. I mean, Trey argued me down with this for an hour the whole day saying he's in, the best in, player in, in the country. I say he way, might be the most dominant. Yeah, the way, yeah, well, yeah, I think that's a little bit more accurate a description. Right. It's like taking nothing away from what he's doing because it's like, I mean, uh, the, the company he's in, like with David Robinson and, and, the, and yeah. the things he's doing right now, I'd say 
I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with, 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 with Coach, but I think that's a more accurate description in that he's just dominant. Right. And they're scheming around his right. dominance. That's why it was going to be a heavyweight right. matchup because Klingon is out there too. Klingon, right, right. Klingon moves a little better. And, you know, and that's what honest. I argue. I, I thought Klingon would be and, – and he did agree – Trey Austin did agree with me on this. I think Klingon would be the better pro. I think Klingon can do more. And his question to me was, is like, man, Bakey getting – in, in reference to Edie, he's getting 27 and 15 a game. And I'm saying, yeah, it's 27, 15. But for me, what he's doing now, I wanted him to do more in the regular season. If he had, it would have been unanimous. Right. I, I and agree. then he said to me, his rebuttal was, well, they were blowing out teams and they would pull him out. I understand that. But what I'm saying, the level of dominance that he's doing now, he could be in my discussion. Now, I do think he's the best big man, but here's my thing. I have different criteria. Cole, I want to get your opinion on this next. When you say the best player in college basketball, okay, for me, Edie is the most dominant because for what he does, where he posts up, what he can be on the defensive end, him being a big man and the skill set that he has for being a big man, the fundamentals, the footwork, for that position, he's the most dominant. When I think about the best player, to me, Edie has somebody has to give him the ball. And there's no disrespect to him. The best player to me doesn't need anybody to give them the ball. They can handle, they can shoot, they can play defense. To me, the best player means you have the best skill set all around. You have the best temperament when it's necessary. And what I mean by that is you can pass the ball when necessary. You can make the big shot when you're necessary. You can make the best pass when it's necessary. That's my idea of being the best player in college basketball, meaning that there is nothing we can do to stop you on any angle in any aspect of the game. Now, that sounds crazy to people, but I tell people all the time, and I told Trey this, I don't necessarily go off of stats all the time when it comes to saying who's the best player in the NCAA. Now, Edie has a case. His impact is the most dominant in the game but again to me the best player you got to be able to do everything and when i say everything like we just talked about luca like to me luca is in the mvp conversation not because he can just score at will it's the plays that he makes scoring is one aspect of the game can luca make the right pass if luca is not on that team what kind of team are they can Luka get a big rebound when it's necessary? Now, one knock that I would have for Luka being the most valuable player in the league is defensively. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, it's a subjective opinion. Cole, who do you think is the best player in college basketball? I said if you want to say best player. So was, I have two different definitions. Best player, I think he's the best player in college because it's college basketball. Best upside, it would be totally different. So best play, I'm say Edie. Um, based off numbers, based on what he's doing and where he's supposed to be doing it, when he's supposed to be doing it. Best NBA prospect to me and overall NBA talent would be Reeves from Kentucky to me. I think he's the next hidden gem in this in this uh in this draft player coming out. Right, right, so. right, right. Shout out to that. All right, Chuck, my producer just pointed at the time. Chuck, let me do one more topic, and then we out of here because I got to get to this. And I definitely this, – this last topic is in boxing, and uh, I'm interested to really get Cole's opinion on this. All right, so over the weekend, Sebastian, Sebastian Fandora in the super welterweight division, which is 154 pounds, just beat Tim Zhu to collect the WBO, WBC belts at 154 pounds. Chuck, do me a favor. Pull up the boxingvoice.com again like we did last week. Um, And so there's been talk, Laro, there's been talk, Cole, and that, you know, Crawford is an independent agent right now. And I mean Crawford, I mean Terrence Bud Crawford is an independent agent. He does not have a promotional company. And so Crawford, as we know, is the current. Go down to the 147 division again for me, Chuck which is the welterweight. All right, as you can see at the top of that screen, you see the WBO, which is the World Boxing Association, that, that sanctioning commission. 
Terrence Bud Crawford currently holds that belt at 147 pounds. That is the welterweight division. Now, Fandora, go up one division, Chuck, up right there. So, Fandora, keep going. As you can see, Fandora is now the WBO and WBC champion at 154 pounds, which is a division right above Crawford's division that he just undisputed, which was the 147 pounds. Crawford over the weekend, the WBO has also sanctioned, commissioned that Crawford has activated his status, his championship status at 147 pounds at the WBO to campaign at the WBO division at 154, meaning that Terrence can act. That's one of the many, many things you can enjoy as being a champion in that particular commission. You can activate your championship status skip the lines in the next division or whatever division you want to go to and you can put your name in for the belt which the wbo is the belt that terrence has held the longest will allow him so they are allowing negotiations between him and van and and fandora since he just became the wbo champion at 154. now here's the question i have for you too is this fair should this happen earl spence who just came off one of the most vicious, vicious, hate to say it, know we got kids on here, ass whoopings that took place by the hands of Terrence Crawford, has come to Vegas to watch the Fandura and Tim Zoo fight. And Earl says he's putting his name in the hat. Now, the politics and the question I have from you guys is Earl says he should be he should skip the line. And the reason why he should be able to skip the line is number one, his past resume. And Sebastian Fandora, who just won the belt, is a part of the PBC carousel, premier boxing champions that we all know that Earl is one of the top fighters. Now, there's speculations that, and they talked about it today with, with Fandora on the boxing voice and his managers, and they're saying that Fandora was saying that I would like to fight Terrence Crawford because he's the best fighter in the world. However, in order for it to get the bag, like one of our producers say over here to my right, the bag is with Earl Spence because they're on the quote-unquote same side of the street. Sebastian Fandura fights on PBC, and Earl Spence fights on PBC, which is an easier negotiation, which means that they will starve Crawford out once again. Should Earl Spence be able to skip the line just based on his promotion allegiance and what i mean by that is think about it like this gentlemen if you pbc earl spence is your fighter now we're talking about a business earl spence is your biggest one of your biggest fighters other than tank would you would you would you allow earl spence to take that spot to contend for 154 254 pound belts even though terrence crawford just beat him up let's start with you laro Think about it from PBC side and then think about it from the other side. Should Earl be allowed to skip the line? He shouldn't be because of this last showing, but because there just aren't too many dogs in the camp. And uh, I'm not sure how solid a prospect and, and a champion Fedora, Fandora is, but I uh, if it's a hit or bud, absolutely not. Because I mean, just you know, uh, the South Side rules. <laughs> <laughs> bud can have whatever era was entitled to. You know what I'm saying? Just if it, 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 he should be left that option. You know what I'm saying? So, but they also saying this about Bud Crawford because this can get you out of negotiations. They're saying that. So what Fandora's one of his promoters is saying is it's easier to make a deal with Earl Spence because Earl Spence is willing to take 50-50 right now. But Terrence, some people would say is, it, it, it's fair. He's asking for $15 million. And, and And to counter that, Fandora's promotional, his you know, the guy that was speaking for him today is saying this. Because people are saying, well, like you're saying, man, Crawford should be able to do whatever he want. But you got to remember, like he said, Crawford is moving up to 154. We just won the belts at 154. So why should he get 
Yeah, his resume. And you is should impressive. keep control of the belt. You should, as, as PBC, PBC and the promoters should, should be trying to, to maintain control of the belt, and, and I can understand why they would do that. Takes off bets. top, it just prolongs the inevitable, so to speak. But you get more paper that way. I, I, I assume. Um, just in, in, in terms of you, you, you make more fights. You keep the control of the belt for a little bit longer. It's politics you're tied up in negotiation. You can throw some clauses in there to make it a little bit more competitive. If Errol isn't just ultimately flawed, because see, that's the mistake that I'm making. It's like, will Fundora expose that Errol is Might not be on back. recall? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Because a lot of people said after that fight, Errol should retire. But see, the counterpoint to that, and then we'll get Cole's, and then we'll, we'll get Cole's perspective, and then we'll get out of here. But the counterpoint to that is that the thing about it is, is that people say with Earl, he never took any tune-up fights. He always does this. Even when he was in a car accident, people say, take a tune-up fight. He said, no, I don't need no tune-up fight. And he beat Ugas. So they saying, this is what Earl does. Why are we feeling sorry for him? And then some people say, you got to remember with Earl, he did all the heavy work. He got all three belts at 147. He cleaned up his side of the street. And he's only lost one fight. And he's one of PBC's top fighters. Why shouldn't he be allowed, based on his past resume, why shouldn't he be allowed to skip the line? Because ah, he lost. <laughs> but you also got to remember that. Because that's the thing. That's what we get wrapped up in. And I'm going to go to Cole. Nah, it wasn't no easy bro. loss, but he, he took a he, he, he took. As long easy. as he don't skip to uh, but, but here's the thing, though. It's only one loss. In hindsight, it's only one loss. You you can say, yeah, he got his ass whooped. And, and at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, he got his ass whooped. And Terrence Crawford messed up everybody's plans. Everybody's plan. But at the same time, and that's the thing I'm talking about boxing, Fandora's PBC. Because here's what Fandora's people are saying. Everybody loyal to a flag. All right. Terrence can enforce that WBO status at 154. What would Fandora say is, well, I tell you what, I'll just vacate that belt and just fight Earl with the WBC. And then Terrence will have to figure out, you know what I'm saying, what are you going to do? He's he, he going to fight the next guy up. Which I think, for the fight. Well, and it might just be Josh Kelly, but Terrence ain't going to make no money on that fight. You know what I'm saying? He'll get that belt. You know what I'm saying? But Cole, what do you think? Because you, you, you've been on record as being a Crawford fan. Should Earl um, be allowed to skip the line? So I wouldn't let I wouldn't let Earl skip the line. For one, if I'm from Dura, I feel like you're doing him more favors than you're doing me. And I'm a boxer in your camp. I think I have more to lose by fighting Earl and losing, never being able to fight Crawford, which I think would probably be a more of a moneymaker than the Earl fight would be. I don't want to see no parts of Earl, you know, and it because I don't feel like I get anything out of fighting Earl. So, so you wouldn't to say. So even though Earl is a part of the same team, because you know your promoter's going to say, all right, if you ain't going to fight, if you – we don't want you to fight Terrence because Terrence is not with us. We can make more money with Earl. Think about it like this. If you fight Earl in Dallas, because that's where you're going to fight him at, you're going to make more money fighting in Texas Stadium, fighting Earl, what a lot of people would say would be your best opportunity to beat Earl. you fight a depleted Spence. You can get that bag, as JT would say. You can get that bag. You beat Earl Spence. Now your money goes up. And guess what? Terrence is going to have to lay down the odd turns because at the end of the day, it's still PBC, baby. Earl is still PBC. Sebastian, you PBC. I think and I think, I think. for me, if I'm for Dura, the way I'm looking at it is like, I don't want to fight Earl. He just came off a loss. I want to fight Crawford. I'm a champ. He's a champ. Let's get this See, that's in. what I'm saying about you and, and this dude sitting to my right. Y'all tell me it's about the bag. And I'm just telling you that you get a bigger bag going to Texas Stadium. See how y'all flip flop as boxing fans? Yeah, it's, 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 you get a bigger bag right now, or you get an even bigger bag if you beat the biggest. But the you biggest don't know that. But see, I just before. told you Terrence Crawford wants $15 million. And Earl Spence will take 50 50 to fight you. If you fight Terrence Crawford, Terrence Crawford says, in order for you to fight me, Fandora. It's got to be $15 million on the table. We ain't even got to your end yet. And here's the thing. I'm telling you that why should Terrence Crawford, as your promoter, why should Terrence Crawford 
Earl Spence ain't got nothing to do with you. You just won the 154 pound belt. You the A side. Terrence Crawford never fought at 154. You gonna give Terrence Crawford 15 million dollars? He not even the same gang as us. Whereas if you fight Earl Spence, a depleted Earl Spence, because y'all talk about the bag as Tank fans, you get a bigger bag going to Cowboy Stadium. And you got a better chance because you're not going to beat Terrence Crawford. You got a better chance of beating Earl Spence, which you're going to get a bigger bag. It's going to triple your value. So when you go into the negotiations with Terrence Crawford, guess what? I just beat Earl Spence. I just got a bigger bag with Earl Spence. And I just fought another fight at 154, which you have no fights at 154, Terrence. No disrespect. You're two times undisputed. So you're going to have to do my terms. That's what I'm saying. Y'all fickle as boxing fans. It's all about I, I the bag until it's not see, about the bag. I just don't see. I just don't see where me fighting Earl outside the money is what you what you're saying. Which I'm not making what about, talking about is the bag. But to me, to me, and maybe I'm reading it wrong. I think that me beating Crawford will lead to more money than me beating Earl. So you're gonna pay. And I so think I have more saying, at risk with my reputation if I lose the Earl so, coming so, off the way that he just lost. So rather than I lose the Crawford. So you got no problem with Terrence Crawford competing for your belts. And before we even get to the pay-per-views, and here's the thing, where are you gonna fight Terrence Crawford at? And, and, you and, fight and, also, Omaha? That, and I also think it's based off of for me, if I'm a fighter and we in the same camp and you're trying to promote Earl and give Earl a chance, I'm thinking that you you put Earl above me. And I'm supposed I can't to put Earl me. above you. You you got the belts. So I'm gonna put Earl above you. But that's the way it's coming off. You trying to rejuvenate How? your career. How? I don't want to fight someone who just came off a loss. I want to fight the dude that beat the dude. But yet you just came off a loss and we gave you a shot with Tim Zoo because you just got knocked out by Fandora. So you can't have it both ways. Sebastian Fandora just lost to Brian Mendoza. Tim Zoo picked him because Keith Thurman got hurt. Keith Thurman was supposed to fight on Saturday. So you just got the belts off a loss. So now you're not going to pick Earl Spence who you can make more money with, whom you're going to fight in, in Dallas Cowboys Stadium. Because here's the thing. When you go to table, when you go to the table with Terrence Crawford, number one, he's not a part of your promotional company. He's a free agent. He's mm -hmm. going to want $15 million before pay-per-view numbers comes in. We're not even talking about your purse. So you're going to get your ass whooped, pay him $15 million, and lose the belts. The way I look at it is he's still going to get – that it's amount of money is going to be more it's than It's worth the risk. You get, but that's what I'm saying. It's, it's Y'all saying it's worth the risk because y'all looking at the legacy of Crawford. But again, we will sit at the same table and people will tell me it's about the bag. You get a bigger bag with Earl Spence. You get a better chance of, of beating a depleted Earl Spence. Because when you fight Terrence Crawford, number one, you're not fighting him in Cowboy Stadium. We don't even know where you're going to fight it. You're going to fight him in Vegas. Okay? You go to Vegas. He's telling you, based on his accomplishments, and rightly so, I'm an independent agent. I need $15 million to step in the ring with you. Okay? All of that money is going to him before you even step in the ring. And then you're going to get your ass whooped. You're going to lose. So you're going to lose $15 million. The pay-per-views, he's going to get the back end. You'll get a little bit. You lose your belts. We as a promotional company, as PBC, just like he said, we lose the belts. And guess what? Terrence Crawford, like Devin Haney, can move any way they want to. And the belts are with – that. that's what they mad at Haney right now. Haney by himself. So that's why I'm asking him as a Crawford fan because I knew he was going to say that because he likes Crawford. But why would I fight Terrence Crawford – I got to give a, I just became champion. I, I got to give him $15 million for him to sign. Then I'm going to lose. He's going to take my belts. I got nothing. My mm -hmm. promotional company got nothing. What what money? I know he, I know Crawford asking for $15 million, but what money does he stand to make? Not Crawford, but Fedora. Oh, if, if he was to fight Crawford. What? A million? Two million? Oh, oh. On the pay per view numbers, cause see, and they, you don't even. And here's the thing: they gonna count on cold to tune in. You know what exactly. I'm saying? They they counting on the diehards for. And for, here's the thing: and, and say this about Terrence Crawford, as great as he is, 
it's been two promotional companies that he has not stayed with. This is the downside of our Crawford. Great fighter, but business. Top rank don't want nothing to do with him. PBC, because that's my point of our Crawford. You wanted the Canelo fight. You deserve it. But you can't fight Canelo. Number one, Canelo don't want to fight you. Number two, Canelo's with PBC. You're across the street again. If you would have signed with PBC, and, and I'm not being a hypocrite, I don't like PBC. But I also understand this. In order for him to beat Earl, he had to sign with PBC mm -hmm. to get that fight. So here you go again. You win your belts, two-time undisputed. I ain't signing with them no more. Then what you going to do? You know, you can't make the big fight unless you sign with us. So it's like, yeah, does he deserve a shot at Fandora? Activate his WBO. All, all PBC going to tell Fandora to do is, we're not giving him that belt. Drop that belt. Because when he fight Josh Kelly, which is the next contender in the mm -hmm. WBO, he going to fight at Omaha. He going to make $2 million. And then he going to... He still need us because mm -hmm. who he going to want to fight next? Canelo. And he still got to come back to PBC. Mm -hmm. He's still going to want to fight Canelo or Crawford. Like he's still going to want. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> I, I don't like it. Fight Spitz in Cowboy Stadium. Bag up. Bag up. Tank. <laughs> Get your pay-per-view numbers up at Cowboy Stadium. And then go get your ass whooped. And then go get your ass whooped. <laughs> Earl Spence. Follow, follow. That's what I follow the Earl Spence blue. Thank you. Follow the bag. Go like, get your bag, get your ass whooped, and go overseas. Exactly. <laughs> I see what Cole said. That's why that's why I did this. Because you can't have it both ways. Now it's like we fight mm -hmm. for legacy. Now we fight for a bag. Which one is it? Because I'm I'm actually with you, Cole. I, I like legacy. But I also know this. It don't mean nothing. You can't enjoy it. Man. I can't drop these. I'm not finna drop these bills to pay this dude twenty million dollars, and he finna beat my ass, and I ain't got nothing. And then I go back to the line, back of the line. You know what I'm saying? But but if he if he already has the mindset, he thinking like that, then he shouldn't be boxing. Cause I ain't thinking I'm stepping in the ring losing to anybody. I mean, but we know. But we know exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like you say, we know. Like we know what's going on. But <laughs> I ain't in it to lose. So you taking I, the Crawford fight. So you you don't mind giving Crawford that bread to take I your bill. I don't mind giving Crawford that bread. I want to go down being able to say, yo, I fought the best, man. Oh, like bro. everything is, that's just me. Bro, I'm, bro, bro. I'm old school, man. I'm bro, all about bro. See, that's the problem with you, man. You be flip-flopping though, because <laughs> which is which is why <laughs> at least Jason said <laughs> but Javante different though. Javante different when you're already at the top. You you only fighting yourself. <laughs> That's what he fighting. He fighting himself. <laughs> true, true, true. But you're supposed to go get the bag, right? First. First. That's bro. what he's doing. That's what Javante doing. He's getting the bag. Oh, it we, applied to Javante. You don't apply to Javante. We ain't talking about, talk about, talk about, you know. you, you about know who's not going to get the bag because I actually think he don't care about the bag. I think Tyson going to knock him out in the first round. Yo. Hey, I'm fearing that Tyson, that fight ain't going to happen. I'm hearing that the commission not letting Tyson. They don't think he's – you got because Tyson is open. Tyson, I'm 57, six, yeah. I'm hearing that – I'm hearing that I've seen Rockman Jr. is going to step in. And stop the fight? Nah, they saying that they, – so they have to get the fight commission, and no commission is admitting Tyson because his age to fight. You got to remember, Jake well, Tyson is an animal. Yeah, but he like 56, Cole. Nobody wants to be responsible if he gets hurt for commission. Tyson did knock Jake Paul out. I bro. believe it, too. But I'm just telling you, the commissions are like, we not finna, because if he get hurt. Yeah, that's all now. Jake you know Paul probably paying him. He probably just wanted to get an anthem. He's probably like, yo, just don't prove this fight, yo. I, I see the way he hit. So it's like the sanctioning fighters in Dallas got a problem with well, you got the venue and everything. You, well, it's not even the WBO or none of them like that. It's just somebody has to say, we provide the physicals, we clear. Yeah. Nobody wants to clear Tyson <laughs> because of his age. It's cold blood. Gotta yeah. go overseas. Yeah. So they might have to get go that, overseas. The turf. problem is it's it's the Netflix fight, and that'll be big. 
I got to talk to the sheet. But I do think Tyson will Talk to the sheet. Talk to the sheet. Talk to the sheet. Yeah, we but only anyway, know let's get out of here, man. Chuck <laughs> didn't already got on me. We got a two-hour show, but we've been yeah. doing it. All right, but let's give our shout-outs to the new unified, like I just told Cole, WBA Junior Wilt. Middleweight champion Sebastian Fedora, who defeated former champion Tim Zhu in a great fight, split decision in Las Vegas. Shout out to him because his sister is also a champion. Gabriella, Gabriella Fedora is also a champion. So the first time in boxing history that we've had a brother and sister current champion. So shout out to the Fedoras, man. I don't know how long it's going to last, but he is a champion. Shout out to the New York Yankees for sweeping the Houston Astros this past weekend. I'm not a hater. I will give the shout out to New York for doing that. Shout out to Major League Baseball for coming back. I think shout out to did the UConn women make the Final Four too? Uh, yes, I think so. So the men and women did, huh? Uh, shout out to them. North, North Carolina women. State men and women did too. They said that, but I thought that was April mm-hmm. Fools. Did North Carolina women, North Carolina State women make oh, it too? Geez. The Final Four. I wasn't sure. About I knew they that. was all. I know they both made it. Men and women made the elite eight. Okay, know about the that's what I think. That yeah, 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 yeah. Shout out to both Jalen Bronson and Victor Wimby for putting together a monumental night. I believe it was on last Friday where Bronson finished with sixty-one points, four rebounds, six <sighs> assists, and Wimby finished with a career high forty points, twenty rebounds, seven assists. And Wimby was the first rookie since Shaq to record a forty-point, twenty rebound game. So shout out to that, man. That makes the NBA look good, a monumental matchup. But shout out to you guys, man. Shout out to Cole all the way to New York. Shout out to my man Laro. Been busting it down, holding us down with the show. Shout out to Chuck, the CEO producer. Shout out to JT for sitting in on with us, the other big-time producer at Most Serious Entertainment. Shout out to everybody who's in the chat. Trey, George, everybody. Shout out to the Iowa women's basketball team. Did they win, Cole? Did Iowa win? I owe one. All right. Shout out to Caitlin Clark. No disrespect to LSU. Shout out to them, Angel Reese, and everybody. But shout out to the audience. We all appreciate you for this episode of Debate with Bake Podcast. Check us out next week. And we are out.